the gem collector by p g woodhouse chapter one the supper room of the savoy hotel was all brightness and glitter and gaiety but sir james willoughby pitt baronet of the united kingdom looked round him through the smoke of his cigarette and felt moodily that this was a flat world despite the geographers and that he was very much alone in it he felt old if it is ever allowable for a young man of twenty-six to give himself up to melancholy reflections jimmy pitt might have been excused for doing so at that moment nine years ago he had dropped out or to put it more exactly had been kicked out and had ceased to belong to london and now he had returned to find himself in a strange city jimmy pitt's complete history would take long to write for he had contrived to crowd much into those nine years abridged it may be told as follows there were two brothers a good brother and a bad brother sir eustace pitt the latter married money john his younger brother remained a bachelor it may be mentioned to check needless sympathy that there was no rivalry between the two john pitt had not the slightest desire to marry the lady of his brother's choice or any other lady he was a self-sufficing man who from an early age showed signs of becoming some day a financial magnate matters went on much the same after the marriage john continued to go to the city eustace to the dogs neither brother had any money of his own the fortune of the pits having been squandered to the ultimate farthing by the sportive gentleman who had held the title in the days of the regency when whites and the cocoa tree were in their prime and fortunes had a habit of disappearing in a single evening four years after the marriage lady pitt died and the widower having spent three years and a half at monte carlo working out an infallible system for breaking the bank to the great contentment of monsieur blanc and the management in general proceeded to the gardens where he shot himself in the orthodox manner leaving many liabilities few assets and one son the good brother by this time a man of substance in lombard street adopted the youthful successor to the title and sent him to a series of schools beginning with the kindergarten and ending with eton unfortunately eton demanded from jimmy a higher standard of conduct than he was prepared to supply and a week after his seventeenth birthday his career as an etonian closed prematurely john pitt thereupon delivered an ultimatum jimmy could choose between the smallest of the small posts in his uncle's business and one hundred pounds in bank-notes coupled with the usual hand-washing and disowning jimmy would not have been his father's son if he had not dropped at the money the world seemed full to him of possibilities for a young man of parts with a hundred pounds in his pocket he left for liverpool that day and for new york on the morrow for the next nine years he is off the stage which is occupied by his uncle john proceeding from strength to strength now head partner next chairman of the company into which the business had been converted and finally a member of parliament silent as a wax figure but a great comfort to the party by virtue of liberal contributions to its funds it may be thought curious that he should make jimmy his heir after what had happened but it is possible that time had softened his resentment or he may have had a dislike for public charities the only other claimant for his wealth at any rate it came about that jimmy reading in a chicago paper that if sir james willoughby pitt baronet would call upon mr snell hazelwood and delane solicitors of lincoln's inn fields london he would hear of something to his advantage had called and heard something very much to his advantage wherefore we find him on this night of july supping in lonely magnificence at the savoy and feeling at the moment far less conscious of the magnificence than of the loneliness watching the crowd with a jaundiced eye jimmy had found his attention attracted chiefly by a party of three a few tables away the party consisted of a pretty girl a lady of middle age and stately demeanor plainly her mother and a light-haired weedy young man of about twenty 
it had been the almost incessant prattle of this youth and the particularly high-pitched gurgling laugh which shot from him at short intervals which had drawn jimmy's notice upon them and it was the curious cessation of both prattle and laugh which now made him look again in their direction the young man faced jimmy and jimmy looking at him could see that all was not well with him he was pale he talked at random a slight perspiration was noticeable on his forehead jimmy caught his eye there was a hunted look in it given the time and the place there were only two things which could have caused that look either the light-haired young man had seen a ghost or he had suddenly realized that he had not enough money to pay the check jimmy's heart went out to the sufferer he took a card from his case scribbled the words can i help on it and gave it to a waiter to take the young man who was now in a state bordering on collapse the next moment the light-haired one was at his table talking in a feverish whisper i say he said it's frightfully good of you old chap it's frightfully awkward i've come out with too little money i hardly like to what i mean to say is you've never seen me before and that's all right said jimmy only too glad to help it might have happened to anyone will this be enough he placed a five-pound note on the table the young man grabbed at it with a rush of thanks i say thanks fearfully he said i don't know what i'd have done i'll let you have it back tomorrow. here's my card blunt's my name spinny blunt is your address on your card i can't remember oh by jove i've got it in my hand all the time the gurgling laugh came into action again refreshed and strengthened by its rest savoy mansions eh i'll come round tomorrow thanks frightfully again old chap i don't know what i should have done he flitted back to his table bearing the spoil and jimmy having finished his cigarette paid his check and got up to go it was a perfect summer night he looked at his watch there was time for a stroll on the embankment before bed he was leaning on the balustrade looking across the river at the vague mysterious mass of buildings on the surrey side when a voice broke in on his thoughts say boss excuse me jimmy spun round a ragged man with a crop of fiery red hair was standing at his side the light was dim but jimmy recognized that hair spike he cried the other gaped then grinned a vast grin of recognition mr james gee this cop's de limit three years had passed since jimmy had parted from spike mullins red spike to the new york police but time had not touched him to jimmy he looked precisely the same as in the old new york days a policeman sauntered past and glanced curiously at them he made as if to stop then walked on a few yards away he halted jimmy could see him watching covertly he realized that this was not the place for a prolonged conversation spike he said do you know the savoy mansions sure foist to the left across the way come on there i'll meet you at the door we can't talk here that cop's got his eye on us he walked away as he went he smiled the policeman's inspection had made him suddenly alert and on his guard yet why what did it matter to sir james pitt baronet if the whole police force of london stopped and looked at him queer thing habit he said as he made his way across the road chapter two a black figure detached itself from the blacker shadows and shuffled stealthily to where jimmy stood on the doorstep that you spike asked jimmy in a low voice that's right mr james come on in he led the way up to his rooms switched on the electric light and shut the door spike stood blinking at the sudden glare he twirled his battered hat in his hands his red hair shone fiercely jimmy inspected him out of the corner of his eye and came to the conclusion that the mullins finances must be at a low ebb spike's costume differed in several important details from that of the ordinary well-groomed man about town 
there was nothing of the flaneer about the bowery boy his hat was of the soft black felt fashionable on the east side of new york it was in poor condition and looked as if it had been up too late the night before a black tail-coat burst at the elbows stained with mud was tightly buttoned across his chest this evidently with the idea of concealing the fact that he wore no shirt an attempt which was not wholly successful a pair of gray flannel trousers and boots out of which two toes peeped coyly completed the picture even spike himself seemed to be aware that there were points in his appearance which would have distressed the editor of a men's fashion paper scuse these duds he said me man's been a mislaid de trunk with me best suit in it this is me number two don't mention it spike said jimmy you look like a matinee idol have a drink spike's eye gleamed as he reached for the decanter he took a seat cigar spike sure thanks mr james jimmy lit his pipe spike after a few genteel sips threw off his restraint and finished the rest of his glass at a gulp try another suggested jimmy spike's grin showed that the idea had been well received jimmy sat and smoked in silence for a while he was thinking the thing over he had met spike mullins for the first time in rather curious circumstances in new york and for four years the other had followed him with a fidelity which no dangers or hardships could affect whatever mr james did said or thought was to spike the best possible act speech or reflection of which man was capable for four years their partnership had continued and then conducting a little adventure on his own account in jimmy's absence spike had met with one of those accidents which may happen to any one the police had gathered him in and he had passed out of jimmy's life what was puzzling jimmy was the problem of what to do with him now that he had re-entered it mr james was one man sir james willoughby pitt baronet another on the other hand spike was plainly in low water and must be lent a helping hand spike was looking at him over his glass with respectful admiration jimmy caught his eye and spoke well spike he said curious us meeting like this de limit agreed spike i can't imagine you three thousand miles away from new york how do you know the cars still run both ways on broadway a wistful look came into spike's eye i thought it was time to give old london a call de cops seemed like as if they didn't have no use for me in new york they don't give de glad smile to a boy out of prison poor old spike said jimmy you've had bad luck haven't you fierce the other agreed but whatever induced you to try for that safe without me they were bound to get you you should have waited that's right boss if i never says another word i was a farmer for fair at de game without use but i thought i'd try to do something so that i'd have something to show use when you come back so i says here's this safe and here's me and i'll get busy with it and then mr james will be pleased for fair when he gets back so i has a try and they gets me while i'm at it we'll cut out that part well it's over now at any rate what have you been doing since you came to england getting moved on by the cops mostly and sleeping in the park well you needn't sleep in the park any more spike you can pitch your moving tent with me and you'll want some clothes we'll get those tomorrow you're the sort of figure they can fit off the peg you're not too tall which is a good thing bad thing for me mr james if i'd been taller i'd have stood for being a new york cop and been buying a brownstone house on fifth avenue by this it's de cops that makes de money in old manhattan that's who it is you're right there said jimmy at least partly i suppose half the new york force does get rich by graft there are honest men among them but we didn't happen to meet them that's right we didn't there was old man mckeechern mckeechern yes if any of them got rich he would be the man he was the worst grafter of the entire bunch 
I could tell you some stories about old Pat McEachern, Spike. If half those yarns were true, he must be a wealthy man by now. We shall hear of him running for mayor one of these days. Say, Mr. James, wasn't you stuck on de Goyle? What girl? said Jimmy quietly. Old man, McEachern's Goyle, Molly. They used to say that use was her steady. If you don't mind, Spike, friend of my youth. We'll cut out that, said Jimmy. When I want my affairs discussed, I'll mention it. Till then, see? Sure, said Spike, who saw nothing beyond the fact, dimly realized that he had said something which had been better left unsaid. Jimmy chewed the stem of his pipe savagely. Spike's words seemed to have touched a spring and let loose feelings which he had kept down for three years. Molly McEachern so they used to say that he was engaged to molly he cursed spike mullins in his heart well-meaning blundering spike who was now sitting on the edge of his chair drawing sorrowfully at his cigar and wondering what he had done to give offence the years fell away from jimmy and he was back in new york standing at the corner of forty-second street with half an hour to wait because the fear of missing her had sent him there too early sitting in central park with her while the squirrels came down and begged for nuts walking damn spike they had been friends nothing more he had never said a word her father had warned her against him old pat mckeechern knew how he got his living and could have put his hand on the author of half a dozen burglaries by which the police had been officially baffled that had been his strong point he had never left tracks. There was never any evidence. But McEacher knew, and he had intervened stormily when he came upon them together. And Molly had stood up for him, till her father had apologized confusedly, raging inwardly the while at his helplessness. It was after that. Mr. James, said Spike. Jimmy's wits returned. Hello, he said. Mr. James, what's doing here? Put me next to the game. Is it the old lay? You'll want me with you, I guess. Jimmy laughed and shut the door on his dreams. I'd quite forgotten I hadn't told you about myself, Spike. Do you know what a baronet is? Search me. What's the answer? A baronet's the noblest work of man, Spike. I am one. Let wealth and commerce, laws and learning, or is it art and learning, die but leave us still our old nobility i'm a big man now spike i can tell you gee my position has also the advantage of carrying a good deal of money with it plunks you have grasped it plunks dollars doubloons i line up with the thick wads now spike i don't have to work to turn a dishonest penny any longer the horrid truth sank slowly into the other's mind Say, what, Mr. James? You don't need to go on de old lay no more? You're cutting it out for fair? That's the idea. Spike gasped. His world was falling about his ears. Now that he had met Mr. James again, he had looked forward to a long and prosperous partnership in crime, with always the master mind behind him to direct his movements and check him if he went wrong. But he had looked out upon the richness of London, and he had said with blucher what a city to loot and here was his leader shattering his visions with a word have another drink spike said the lost leader sympathetically it's a shock to you i guess i taught mr james i know you did and i'm very sorry for you but it can't be helped noblesse oblige spike we of the old aristocracy mustn't do these things we should get ourselves talked about. Spike sat silent, with a long face. Jimmy slapped him on the shoulder. After all, he said, living honestly may be the limit, for all we know. Numbers of people do it, I've heard, and enjoy themselves tremendously. We must give it a trial, Spike. We'll go out together and see life. Pull yourself together and be cheerful, Spike. After a moment's reflection, the other grinned, albeit faintly. "'That's right,' said Jimmy Pitt. 
you'll be the greatest success ever in society. All you have to do is brush your hair, look cheerful, and keep your hands off the spoons. For in society, Spike, they invariably count them after the departure of the last guest. Sure, said Spike, as one who thoroughly understood this sensible precaution. And now, said Jimmy, we'll be turning in. Can you manage sleeping on the sofa for one night? Gee, I've been sleeping on the embankment all the last week. This is too de good, Mr. James. Chapter 3 in the days before the Welshman began to expend his surplus energy in playing football, he was accustomed, whenever the monotony of his everyday life began to oppress him, to collect a few friends and make raids across the border into England, to the huge discomfort of the dwellers on the other side. It was to cope with this habit that Corvin Abbey in Shropshire came into existence. It met a long-felt want. Ministering to the spiritual needs of the neighborhood in times of peace, it became a haven of refuge when trouble began. From all sides people poured into it, emerging cautiously when the marauders had disappeared. In the whole history of the Abbey there is but one instance recorded of a bandit attempting to take the place by storm, and the attack was an emphatic failure. On receipt of one ladle full of molten lead, aimed to a nicety by John the novice, who seems to have been anything but a novice at markmanship, this warrior retired, done to a turn, to his mountain fastness, and is never heard of again. He would seem, however, to have passed the word round among his friends, for subsequent raiding parties studiously avoided the abbey and a peasant who had succeeded in crossing its threshold was for the future considered to be home and out of the game. Corvin Abbey, as a result, grew in power and popularity. Abbott succeeded Abbott, the lake at the foot of the hill was restocked at intervals, the lichen grew on the walls, and still the abbey endured. But time, assisted by His Majesty King Henry the Eighth, had done its work. The monks had fled, the walls crumbled, and in the twentieth century the abbey was a modern country house, and the owner a rich American. Of this gentleman the world knew but little. That he had made money, and a good deal of it, was certain. His name, Patrick McEachern, suggested Irish parentage, and a slight brogue, noticeable, however, only in moments of excitement, supported this theory. He had arrived in London some four years back, taken rooms at the Albany, and gone into society. England still firmly believes that wealth accrues to every resident of New York by some mysterious process, not understandable of the Briton. McEachern and his money were accepted by society without question. His solecisms, which at first were numerous, were passed over as so quaint and refreshing. People liked his rugged good humor. He speedily made friends, among them Lady Jane Blunt, the still youthful widow of a man about town, who, after trying for several years to live at the rate of ten thousand per annum with an income of two and a half, had finally given up the struggle and drank himself peacefully into the tomb, leaving her in sole charge of their one son, Spencer Archbald. Possibly because he was the exact antithesis of the late lamented, Lady Jane found herself drawn to Mr. McEachern. Whatever his faults, he had strength, and after her experience of married life with a weak man, Lady Jane had come to the conclusion that strength was the only male quality worth consideration. When a year later, McEachern's daughter Molly had come over, it was Lady Jane who took her under her wing and introduced her everywhere. In the fifth month of the second year of their acquaintance, Mr. McEachern proposed and was accepted. The bridegroom, said a society paper, is one of those typical captains of industry of whom our cousins across the street can boast so many. Tall, muscular, square-shouldered, with the bulldog jaw and twinkling gray eye of the born leader. You look at him and turn away satisfied. You have seen a man. Lady Jane, who had fallen in love with the Abbey some years before, during a visit to the neighborhood, 
had prevailed upon her square-shouldered lord to turn his twinkling gray eye in that direction and the captain of industry with the remark that here at last was a real bully old shorefire english stately home had sent down builders and their like not in single spies but in battalions with instructions to get busy the results were excellent a happy combination of deep purse on the part of the employer and excellent taste on the part of the architect had led to the erection of one of the handsomest buildings in Stropeshire. to stand on the hill at the back of the house was to see a view worth remembering the lower portion of the hill between the house and the lake had been cut into broad terraces the lake itself with its island with a little boathouse in the centre was a glimpse of fairyland mr mckeechern was not poetical but he had secured as his private sanctum a room which commanded this view he was sitting in this room one evening about a week after the meeting between spinney and jimmy pitt at the savoy see here jane he was saying this is my point i've been fixing up things in my mind and this is the way i make it out i reckon there's no sense in taking risks when you needn't you've a mighty high-toned bunch of guests here i'm not saying you haven't what i say is it would make us all feel more comfortable if we knew there was a detective in the house keeping his eye skinned i'm not alluding to any of them in particular but how are we to know that all these social headliners are on the level if you mean our guests pat i can assure you that they are all perfectly honest lady jane looked out of the window as she spoke at a group of those under discussion certainly at the moment the sternest censor could have found nothing to cavil at in their movements some were playing tennis some clock golf and the rest were smoking she had frequently complained in her gentle languid way of her husband's unhappily suspicious nature she could never understand it for her part she suspected no one she liked and trusted everybody which was the reason why she was so popular and so often taken in mr mckeechern looked bovine as was his habit when he was endeavoring to gain a point against opposition they may be on the level he said i'm not saying anything against anyone but i've seen a lot of crooks in my time and it's not the ones with the low brows and the cauliflower ears that you want to watch for it's the innocent willies who look as if all they could do was to leave the cotillion and wear bangles on their ankles i've had a lot to do with them and it's up to a man that don't want to be stung not to go by what a fellow looks like really pat dear i sometimes think you ought to have been a policeman what is the matter matter you shouted shouted not me spark from my cigar fell on my hand you know you smoke too much pat said his wife seizing the opening with the instinct which makes an irishman at a fair hit every head he sees i'm all right me dear faith i could smoke one hundred a day and no harm done by the way of proving the assertion he puffed out with increased vigor at his cigar the pause gave him time to think of another argument which might otherwise have escaped him when we were married me dear jane he said there was a detective in the room to watch the presents two of them i remember seeing them at once there go two of the boys i said to myself i mean he added hastily two of the police force but detectives at wedding receptions are quite ordinary nobody minds them you see the presents are so valuable that it would be silly to risk losing them and are there not valuable things here asked mckeechern triumphantly which it would be silly to risk losing and sir thomas is coming to-day with his wife and you know what a deal of jewelry she always takes about her oh julia said lady jane a little disdainfully her late husband's brother thomas's wife was one of the few people to whom she objected and indeed she was not alone in this prejudice few who had much to do with her did like lady blunt that rope of pearls of hers said mr mckeechern cost forty thousand pounds no less so they say so she says 
but if you were thinking of bringing down a detective to watch over julia's necklace pat you needn't trouble i believe she takes one about with her wherever she goes disguised as thomas's valet still me dear pat you're absurd laughed lady jane i won't have you littering up the house with great clumsy detectives you must remember that you aren't in horrid new york now where everybody you meet wants to rob you who is it that you suspect who is the what is the word you're so fond of crook that's it who is the crook i don't want to mention names said mckeechern cautiously and i cast no suspicions but who is that pale thin willy who came yesterday the one that says the clever things that nobody understands lulu wesson why patrick he is the most delightful boy what can you suspect of him i don't suspect him of anything but you will remember that i was telling about the sort of boy you want to watch that's what that boy is he may be the straightest ever but if i was told there was a crook in the company and wasn't put next to who it was he's the boy that would get my vote what dreadful nonsense are you talking pat i believe you suspect every one you meet i suppose you will jump to the conclusion that this man whom spenny is bringing down with him today is a criminal of some sort how's that spenny bringing a friend there was not a great deal of enthusiasm in mckeechern's voice his stepson was not a young man whom he respected very highly spenny regarded his stepfather with nervous apprehension as one who would deal with his shortcomings with a vigor and severity of which his mother was incapable the change of treatment which had begun after her marriage with the american had had an excellent effect upon him but it had not been pleasant as nebuchadnezzar is reported to have said of his vegetarian diet it may have been wholesome but it was not good mckeechern for his part regarded spinney as a boy who would get into mischief unless he had an eye fixed upon him so he proceeded to fix that eye yes i must be seen harding about getting the rooms ready spinney's friend is bringing his man with him who is his friend he doesn't say he just says he's a man he met in london um and what does that grunt mean i should like to know i believe you've begun to suspect the poor man already without seeing him i don't say i have but a man can pick up strange people in london pat you're perfectly awful i believe you suspect every one you meet what do you suspect of me i wonder that's easy answered said mckeechern robbery from the person what have i stolen me heart me dear replied mckeechern gallantly with a vast grin after that said his wife i think i'd better go i had no idea you could make such pretty speeches pat well me dear don't send for that detective it really wouldn't do if it got about that we couldn't trust our guests we should never live it down you won't will you very well me dear what followed may afford some slight clue to the secret of mr patrick mckeechern's rise in the world it certainly suggests singleness of purpose which is one of the essentials of success no sooner had the door closed behind lady jane than he went to his writing-table took pen and paper and wrote the following letter to the manager rags detective agency holborn bars london e c sir with reference to my last of the twenty-eighth alt i should be glad if you would send down immediately one of your best men and making arrangements to receive him shall be glad if you will instruct him as follows viz a that he shall stay at the village inn in character of american seeing sights of england and anxious to inspect the abbey b that he shall call and ask to see me i shall then recognize him as old new york friend and move his baggage from above in to the abbey yours faithfully p mckeechern p s kindly do not send a rube but a real smart man this brief but pregnant letter cost him some pains in its composition he was not a ready writer but he completed it at last to his satisfaction there was a crisp purity in the style which pleased him 
he read it over and put in a couple of commas then he placed it in an envelope and lit another cigar chapter four jimmy's acquaintance with spenny blunt had developed rapidly in the few days following their first meeting spenny had called next morning to repay the loan and two days later had invited jimmy to come down to shropshire with him which invitation jimmy bored with london had readily accepted spike he had decided to take with him in the role of valet the bowery boy was probably less fitted for the post than any one has ever been since the world began but it would not do to leave him at savoy mansions it had been arranged that they should meet spenny at paddington station accompanied by spike who came within an ace of looking almost respectable in the new blue serge jimmy arrived at paddington with a quarter of an hour to spare nearly all london seemed to be at the station with the exception of spenny of that light-haired and hearted youth there were no signs but just as the train was about to start the missing one came skimming down the platform and hurled himself in for the next ten minutes he sat panting at the conclusion of that period he spoke dash it he said i've suddenly remembered i never telegraphed home to let em know what train we were coming by now what'll happen is that there won't be anything at corvin to meet us and take us up to the abbey and you can't get a cab they don't grow such things how far is it to walk five solid miles and uphill most of the way and i've got a bad foot as a matter of fact said jimmy it's just possible that we shall be met after all while i was waiting for you at paddington i heard a man asking if he had to change for corvin he may be going to the abbey too what sort of a looking man tall thin rather a wreck probably my uncle thomas frightful man always trying to roast a chap don't you know still there is one consolation if it is uncle thomas they'll have to send an automobile for him i shouldn't think he'd ever walk more than a hundred yards in his natural not at a stretch he generally stays with us in the summer i wonder if he's bringing aunt julia with him you didn't see her i suppose by any chance tall and pox to beat the band he married her for her money concluded spenny charitably isn't she attractive either aunt julia said spenny with feeling is the absolute limit wait till you see her sort of woman who makes you feel that your hands are the color of a frightful tomato and the size of a billiard table if you know what i mean by gad though you should see her jewels it's perfectly beastly the way that woman crams them on she's got one rope of pearls which is supposed to have cost forty thousand pounds look out for it tonight at dinner it's worth seeing jimmy pitt was distressed to feel distinct symptoms of a revival of the old adam as he listened to these alluring details it was trying a reformed man a little high he could not help thinking with some indignation to dangle forty thousand pounds worth of pearls before his eyes over the freshly turned sods of the grave of his past it was the sort of test which might have shaken the resolution of the oldest established brand from the burning he could not keep his mind from dwelling on the subject even the fact that commercially there was no need for him to think of such things could not restrain him he was rich now and could afford to be honest he tried to keep that fact steadily before him but instinct was too powerful his operations in the old days had never been conducted purely with an eye to financial profit he had collected gems almost as much for what they were as for what they could bring many a time had the faithful spike bewailed the flaw in an otherwise admirable character which had induced his leader to keep a portion of the spoil instead of converting it at once into good dollar bills it had had to go sooner or later but jimmy had always clung to it as long as possible to spike a diamond brooch of cunning workmanship was merely the equivalent of so many plunks that a man otherwise more than sane should value a jewel for its own sake was to him an inexplicable thing jimmy was still deep in thought when the train 
which had been taking itself less seriously for the last half hour stopping at stations of quite minor importance and generally showing a tendency to dawdle halted again aboard with the legend corvin in large letters showed that they had reached their destination here we are said spenny hop out now what's the betting that there isn't room for all of us in the bubble from farther down the train a lady and gentleman emerged that's the man is that your uncle said jimmy guilty said spenny gloomily i suppose we'd better go and tackle them come on they walked up the platform to where sir thomas stood smoking a meditative cigar and watching in a dispassionate way the efforts of his wife to bully the solitary porter attached to the station into a frenzy sir thomas was a very tall very thin man with cold eyes and tight thin lips his clothes fitted him in the way clothes do fit one man in a thousand they were the best part of him his general appearance gave one the idea that his meals did him little good and his meditations rather less his conversation of which there was not a great deal was designed for the most part to sting many years patient and painstaking sowing of his wild oats had left him at fifty-six with few pleasures but among those that remained he ranked high in the discomfiting of his neighbors this is my friend pitt uncle said spenny presenting jimmy with a motion of the hand sir thomas extended three fingers jimmy extended two and the handshake was not a success at this point in the interview spike came up chuckling amiably with a magazine in his hand peachy said spike say mr james the mug that wrote this piece must have been livin out in de woods for fair his stunt ain't writin sure say there's a gazebo what wants to get busy with de heroine's jewels what's locked in de drawer in de dressing room so dis mug what do you think he does why another friend of yours spenny inquired sir thomas politely eyeing the red-haired speaker with interest it's he looked appealingly at jimmy it's only my man said jimmy spike he added in an undertone to the woods chase yourself it's not up to you to do stunts on this beat fade away sure said the abashed spike restored to a sense of his position that's right i got wheels in me coco that's what i've got comin but in here sorry mr james sorry gents me for the tall grass he trotted away your man seems to have a pretty taste in literature said sir thomas to jimmy well my dear finished your chat with the porter lady blunt had come up flushed and triumphant having left the solitary porter a demoralized wreck i'm through she announced crisply well spencer how are you who's this don't stand gaping child who's your friend spenny explained with some incoherence that his name was pitt his uncle had shaken him the arrival of his aunt seemed to unnerve him completely pleased to meet you snapped lady blunt spencer where are your trunks left them behind i suppose no well that's a surprise tell that porter to look after them if you have any trouble with him mention it to me i'll make him jump around where's the automobile outside where take me to it lady blunt when conversing resembled a maxim gun more than anything else in the world i'm afraid said spenny in an abject manner as they left the station that it will be rather a bit of a frightful squash what i mean to say is i hardly think we shall all find room in the auto i see they have only sent the small one lady blunt stopped short and fixed him with a glittering eye i know what it is spencer she said you never telegraphed your mother to tell her what time you were going to arrive spenny opened his mouth feebly but apparently changing his mind made no reply my dear said sir thomas smoothly we must not expect too much of spenny pshaw this was a single shot from the maxim the baited youth looked vainly for assistance to jimmy but er aunt said spenny really i er 
I only just caught the train, didn't I, Pitt? Oh, yes, just got in as it was moving. That was it. I really hadn't time to telegraph, had I, Pitt? Not a minute. And how was it you were so late? Spenny plunged into an explanation, feeling all the time that he was making things worse for himself. Nobody is at his best in the matter of explanations if a lady whom he knows to be possessed of a firm belief in the incurable weakness of his intellect is looking fixedly at him during the recital. A prolonged conversation with Lady Blunt always made him feel exactly as if he were being tied into knots. "'All this,' said Sir Thomas, as his nephew paused for breath, "'is very, very characteristic of our dear Spinney. Our dear Spenny broke into a perspiration. However, continued Sir Thomas, there's room for either you or Pitt, said Jimmy, P I double T. Sir Thomas bowed. In front with the chauffeur, if you care to take the seat. I'll walk, said Jimmy. I'd rather. Frightfully good of you, old chap, whispered Spenny. Sure you don't mind? I do hate walking, and my foot's hurting fearfully. Which is my way? Straight as you go. You go to the... Spenny, said Sir Thomas suavely. Your aunt expresses a wish to arrive at the Abbey in time for dinner. If you could manage to come to some arrangement about that seat. Spenny climbed hurriedly into the automobile. The last Jimmy saw of him was a hasty vision of him being prodded in the ribs by Lady Blunt's parasol, while its owner said something to him which, judging by his attitude, was not pleasant. He watched them out of sight, and started to follow at a leisurely pace. It certainly was an ideal afternoon for a country walk. The sun was just hesitating whether to treat the time as afternoon or evening. Eventually it decided that it was evening, and moderated its beams. After London, the country was deliciously fresh and cool. Jimmy felt, as the scent of the hedges came to him, that the only thing worth doing in the world was to settle down somewhere with three acres and a cow, and become pastoral. There was a marked lack of traffic on the road. Once he met a cart, and once a flock of sheep with a friendly dog. Sometimes a rabbit would dash out into the road, stop to listen, and dart into the opposite hedge, all hind legs and white scut. But except for these he was alone in the world, and gradually there began to be borne in upon him the conviction that he had lost his way. It is difficult to judge distance when one is walking, but it certainly seemed to Jimmy that he must have covered five miles by this time. He must have mistaken the way. He had certainly come straight. He could not have come straighter. On the other hand, it would be quite in keeping with the cheap substitute which serves Spenny Blunt in place of a mind that he should have forgotten to mention some important turning. Jimmy sat down by the roadside. As he sat, there came to him from down the road the sound of a horse's feet trotting. He got up. Here was somebody at last who would direct him. The sound came nearer. The horse turned the corner, and Jimmy saw with surprise that it bore no rider. Hello, he said. Accident? And by Jove, a side saddle. The curious part of it was that the horse appeared in no way a wild horse. It did not seem to be running away. It gave the impression of being out for a little trot on its own account, a sort of equine constitutional. Jimmy stopped the horse, and led it back the way it had come. As he turned the bend in the road, he saw a girl in a riding habit running toward him. She stopped running when she caught sight of him, and slowed down to a walk. "'Thank you so much,' she said, taking the reins from him. "'Oh, Dandy, you naughty old thing!' Jimmy looked at her flushed, smiling face, and uttered an exclamation of astonishment. The girl was staring at him open-eyed. "'Molly!' he cried. "'Jimmy!' And then a curious feeling of constraint fell simultaneously upon them both. Chapter 5 "'How are you, Molly?' "'Quite well. Thank you, Jimmy.' A pause. "'You're looking very well.' 
I'm feeling very well. How are you? Quite well, thanks. Very well indeed. Another pause. And then their eyes met, and at the same moment they burst out laughing. Your manners are beautiful, Jimmy. And I'm so glad you're so well. What an extraordinary thing, us meeting like this. I thought you were in New York. I thought you were. You haven't altered a bit, Molly. Nor have you. How queer this is. I can't understand it. Nor can I. I don't want to. I'm satisfied without. Do you know before I met you, I was just thinking I hadn't a single friend in this country. I'm on my way to stay with a man I've only known a few days, and his people, whom I don't know at all, and a bunch of other guests, whom I've never heard of, and his uncle, who is a sort of human icicle, and his aunt, who makes you feel like thirty cents directly before she starts to talk to you, and the family watchdog, who will probably bite me. But now, you must live near here or you wouldn't be chasing horses about this road. I live at a place called Corvan Abbey. What, Corvan Abbey? Why, that's where I'm going. Jimmy! Oh, I see. You're Spenny's friend. But where is Spenny? At the Abbey by now. He went in the auto with his uncle and aunt. How did you meet Spenny? Oh, I did a very trifling Good Samaritan act, for which he was unduly grateful, and he adopted me from that moment. How long have you been living in England, then? I never dreamed of you being here. I've been on this site about a week. If you want my history in a nutshell, it's this. Rich uncle. Poor nephew. Deceased uncle. Rich nephew. I'm a man with money now. Lots of money. How nice for you, Jimmy. Father came into money, too. That's how I came to be over here. I wish you and father had got on better together. Your father, my dear Molly, has a manner with people he is not fond of which purists might call slightly abrupt. Perhaps things will be different now. The horse gave a sudden whinny. I wish you wouldn't do that sort of thing without warning, said Jimmy to it plaintively. He knows he's near home, and he knows it's his dinner time. There now, you can see the abbey. How do you like it? They had reached a point in the road where the fields to the right sloped sharply downward. A few hundred yards away, backed by woods, stood the beautiful home which ex-policeman McEachern had caused to be builded for him. The setting sun lit up the waters of the lake. No figures were seen to be moving in the grounds. The place resembled a palace of sleep. Well, said Molly. By Jove! Isn't it? said Molly. I'm so glad you like it. I always feel as if I had invented everything around here. It hurts me if people don't appreciate it. Once I took Sir Thomas Blunt up here. It was as much as I could do to induce him to come at all. He simply won't walk. When we got to where we are standing now, I pointed and said, There. And what did he do? Moan with joy? He grunted, and said it struck him as rather rustic. Beast! I met Sir Thomas when we got off the train. Spenny Blunt introduced me to him. He seemed to bear it pluckily, but with some difficulty. I think we had better be going, or they'll be sending out search parties. By the way, Jimmy, said Molly, as they went down the hill, can you act? Can I what? Act. In theatricals, you know. I've never tried. But I've played poker, which I should think is much the same. We are going to do a play, and we want another man. The man who was going to play one of the parts has had to go back to London. Poor devil! Fancy having to leave a place like this and go back to that dingy, overrated town. The big drawing-room of the Abbey was full when they arrived. Tea was going on in a desultory manner. In a chair at the far end of the room, Sir Thomas Blunt surveyed the scene gloomily through the smoke of a cigarette. The sound of Lady Blunt's voice had struck their ears as they opened the door. The Maxim gun was in action with no apparent prospect of jamming. The target of the moment was a fair, tired-looking lady, with a remarkable resemblance to Spinney. Jimmy took her to be his hostess. There was a resigned expression on her face, 
which he thoroughly understood. He sympathized with her. The other occupants of the room stared for a moment at Jimmy in the austere manner peculiar to the Briton who sees a stranger, and then resumed their respective conversations. One of their number, a slight, pale young man, as scientifically clothed as Sir Thomas, left his group and addressed himself to Molly. "'Ah, here you are, Miss McEachern,' he said. "'At last. We were all getting so anxious.' "'Really?' said Molly. "'That's very kind of you, Mr. Wesson.' "'I assure you, yes, positively. A grey gloom had settled upon us. We pictured you in all sorts of horrid situations. I was just going to call for volunteers to scour the country, or whatever it is that one does in such circumstances. I used to read about it in books, but I have forgotten the technical term. I am relieved to find you are not even dusty, though it would have been more romantic if you could have managed a little dust here and there. But don't consider my feelings, Miss McEachern, please. Molly introduced Jimmy to the newcomer. They shook hands, Jimmy with something of the wariness of a boxer in the ring. He felt an instinctive distrust of this man. Why, he could not have said. Perhaps it was a certain subtle familiarity in his manner of speaking to Molly that annoyed him. Jimmy objected strongly to anyone addressing her as if there existed between them some secret understanding. Already the mood of the old New York days was strong upon him. His instinct then had been to hate all her male acquaintances with an unreasoning hatred. He found himself in much the same frame of mind now. "'So you're Spenny's friend,' said Mr. Wesson, "'the man who's going to show us all how to act. What? I believe there's some idea of my being a confused noise without, or something.' "'Haven't they asked you to play Lord Algernon?' inquired Wesson, with more animation than he usually allowed himself to exhibit. "'Who is Lord Algernon?' "'Only a character in the piece we are acting.' "'What does he do?' "'He talks to me most of the time,' said Molly. "'Then,' said Jimmy decidedly, "'I seem to see myself making a big hit.' "'It's a long part if you aren't used to that sort of thing,' said Wesson. He had hoped that the part with its wealth of opportunity would have fallen to himself. "'I am used to it,' said Jimmy. "'Thanks.' "'If that little beast's after Molly,' thought Jimmy, "'there will be trouble.' "'Come along,' said Molly, "'and be introduced and get some tea.' "'Well, Molly, dear,' said Lady Jane, "'with a grateful smile at the interruption. "'We didn't know what had become of you. "'Did Dandy give you trouble?' "'Dandy's a darling, "'and wouldn't do anything of the sort "'if you asked him to. "'He's a kind little oss, as Thomas says. "'He only walked away when I got off "'to pick some roses, "'and I couldn't catch him. "'And then I met Jimmy.' "'I hope you aren't tired out,' said Lady Jane to him. "'We thought you would never arrive. "'It's such a long walk. "'It was really too careless of Spenny "'not to let us know when he expected you. "'I was telling Spencer in the automobile, "'put in Lady Blunt, with ferocity, "'that my father would have horsewhipped him "'if he had been a son of his. "'He would.' "'Really, Julia,' protested Lady Jane rather faintly. "'That's so.' and I don't care who knows it. A boy doesn't want to forget things if he's going to make his way in the world. I told Spencer so in the automobile. Jimmy had noticed that Spenny was not in the room. He now understood his absence. After the ride he had probably felt that an hour or two passed out of his aunt's society would not do him any harm. He was now undergoing a rest cure, Jimmy imagined, in the billiard room. I can assure you, said he, by way of lending a helping hand to the absent one, I really preferred to walk. I have only just landed in England from New York, and it's quite a treat to walk on an English country road again. Are you from New York? I wonder if... Jimmy's an old friend, said Molly. We knew him very well indeed. It was such a surprise meeting him. How interesting, said Lady Jane, languidly as if the intellectual strain of the conversation had been too much for her. "'You will have such lots to talk about, won't you?' "'I say,' said Jimmy, as they moved away, 
"'Who is that fellow Wesson?' "'Oh, a man,' said Molly vaguely. "'There's no need to be fulsome,' said Jimmy. "'He can't hear. "'Mother likes him. "'I don't. "'Mother?' "'Hello,' said Molly. "'There's father.' The door had opened while they were talking, and Mr. Patrick McEachern had walked solidly into the room. The ornaments on the Chippendale tables jingled as he came. Secretly he was somewhat embarrassed at finding himself in the midst of so many people. He had not yet mastered the art of feeling at home in his own house. At meals he did not fear his wife's guests so much. Their attention was in a manner distributed at such times, instead of being, as now, focused upon himself. He stood there square and massive, outwardly the picture of all that was rugged and independent, looking about him for a friendly face. To offer a general remark, or to go boldly and sit down beside one of those dazzling young ladies, like some heavyweight spider beside a Miss Muffet, was beyond him. In his time he had stopped runaway horses, clubbed mad dogs, and helped to break up east side gang fights, when the combatants on both sides were using their guns lavishly and impartially, but his courage failed him here. Why, said Jimmy, is your father here too? I didn't know that. To himself he reviled his luck. How much would he see of Molly now? Her father's views on himself were no sealed book to him. Molly looked at him in surprise. Didn't you know? she said. Didn't I tell you the place belonged to father? What? said Jimmy. This house? Yes, of course. And by gad, I've got it. He has married Spenny Blunt's mother. Well, I'm surprised. Suddenly he began to chuckle. What is it, Jimmy? Why, why, I've just grasped the fact that your father, your father, mind you, is my host. I'm the honored guest at his house. The chuckle swelled into a laugh. The noise attracted McEachern's attention, and looking in the direction whence it proceeded, he caught sight of Molly. With a grin of joy he made for the sofa. Well, father dear, said Molly nervously. Mr. McEachern was staring horribly at Jimmy, who had risen to his feet. How do you do, Mr. McEachern? The ex-policeman continued to stare. Father, said Molly in distress, Father, let me present, I mean, don't you remember Jimmy? You must remember Jimmy, Father. Jimmy Pitt, whom you used to know in New York. Chapter 6 on his native asphalt there are few situations capable of throwing the new york policeman off his balance in that favored clime savoir faire is represented by a shrewd left hook at the jaw and a masterful stroke of the truncheon amounts to a satisfactory repartee thus shall you never take the policeman of manhattan without his answer in other surroundings mr patrick mckeechern would have known how to deal with his young acquaintance Mr. Jimmy Pitt, but another plan of action was needed here. First of all, the hints on etiquette with which Lady Jane had favored him from time to time, and foremost came the mandate, never make a scene. Scenes, Lady Jane had explained, on the occasion of his knocking down an objectionable cabman during their honeymoon trip, were of all things what polite society most resolutely abhorred. The natural man in him must be bound in chains. The sturdy blow must give way to the honeyed word. A cold, really, was the most vigorous retort that the best circles would countenance. It had cost Mr. McEachern some pains to learn this lesson, but he had done it, and he proceeded on the present occasion to conduct himself high and disposedly, according to instructions from headquarters. The surprise of finding an old acquaintance in his company rendered him dumb for a brief space, during which Jimmy looked after the conversation. "'How do you do, Mr. McEachern?' inquired Jimmy genially. "'Quite a surprise meeting you in England.' "'A pleasant surprise. By the way, one generally shakes hands in the smartest circles. Yours seem to be down there somewhere. Might I trouble you, right? Got it.' Thanks. 
he bent forward possessed himself of mr mckeechern's right hand which was hanging limply at his proprietor's side shook it warmly and replaced it why ye asked mr mckeechern gruffly giving a pleasing air of novelty to the hackneyed salutation by pronouncing it as one word he took some little time getting into his stride when carrying on polite conversation very well thank you you're looking as strong as ever mr mckeechern the ex-policeman grunted in a conversational sense he was sparring for wind molly had regained her composure by this time her father was taking the thing better than she had expected it's jimmy father dear she said jimmy pitt dear old james murmured the visitor i know me dear way still well replied jimmy cheerfully sitting up you will notice he added waving a hand in the direction of his teacup and taking nourishment no further bulletins will be issued jimmy is staying here father he is the friend spenny was bringing this is the friend that spenny brought said jimmy in a rapid undertone this is the maiden all forlorn who crossed the seas and lived in the house that sheltered the friend that spenny brought i see me dear said mr mckeerchin slowly wa no i've guessed that one already said jimmy ask me another molly looked reproachfully at him his deplorable habit of chafing her father had caused her trouble in the old days it may be admitted that this recreation of jimmy's was not in the best taste but it must also be remembered that the relations between the two had always been out of the ordinary great as was his affection for molly jimmy could not recollect a time when war had not been raging in a greater or lesser degree between the ex-policeman and himself it is very kind of you to invite me down here said he we shall be able to have some cosy chats over old times when i was a wanderer on the face of the earth and you yes yes interrupted mr mckeechern hastily somewhere else afterward you shall choose time and place of course i was only going to ask you how you liked leaving the united states put in mr mckeechern with an eagerness which broadened his questioner's friendly smile as the honourable lewis wesson came toward them well i'm not saying it was not a wrench at first but i considered it best to lay wall street wall street ye understand before i see before you fell a victim to the feverish desire for reckless speculation which is so marked a characteristic of the american business man what that's it said the other relieved i too have been speculating said mr wesson as to whether you would care to show me the rose garden miss mckeechern as you promised yesterday of all flowers i love roses best you remember bryant's lines miss mckeechern the rose that lives its little hour is prized beyond the sculptured flower jimmy interposed firmly i'm very sorry he said but the fact is miss mckeechern has just promised to take me with her to feed the fowls i gamble on fowls he thought there must be some in a high-class establishment of this kind i'd quite forgotten said molly i thought you had we'd better start at once nothing upsets a fowl more than having to wait for dinner nonsense me dear molly said mr mckeechern bluffly run along and show mr wesson the roses nobody wants to waste time over a bunch of hens perhaps not said jimmy thoughtfully perhaps not i might be better employed here amusing the people by telling them all about our old new york days and mr mckeechern might have been observed and was so observed by jimmy to swallow somewhat convulsively but as molly promised ye said he just so said jimmy my own sentiments neatly expressed shall we start miss mckeechern that fella said mr wesson solemnly to his immortal soul is a damned bounder and cad he added after a moment's reflection the fowls lived in a little world of noise and smells at the back of the stables the first half of the journey thither was performed in silence molly's cheerful little face was set in what she probably imagined to be a forbidding scowl 
the tilt of her chin spoke of displeasure if a penny would be of any use to you said jimmy breaking the tension i'm not at all pleased with you said molly severely how can you say such savage things and me an orphan too what's the trouble what have i done you know perfectly well making fun of father like that my dear girl he loved it brainy badinage of that sort is exchanged every day in the best society you should hear the dukes and earls the wit the esprit the flow of the soul mine is nothing to it what's this in the iron pot is this what you feed them queer birds hens i wouldn't touch the stuff for a fortune it looks perfectly poisonous flock around you pullets come in your thousands all bad nuts returned and a souvenir goes with every corpse a little more of this putrescent mixture for you sir certainly pick up your dead pick up your dead an unwilling dimple appeared on molly's chin like a sunbeam through clouds all the same she said you ought to be ashamed of yourself jimmy i haven't time when i find myself stopping in the same house with a girl i've been looking for for three years molly looked away there was silence for a moment used you ever to think of me she said quietly that curious constraint which had fallen upon jimmy in the road came to him again now as a sobering blow something which he could not define had changed the atmosphere suddenly in an instant like a shallow stream that runs babbling over the stones into some broad still pool the note of their talk had deepened yes he said simply he could find no words for what he wished to say i've thought of you often said molly he took a step toward her but the moment had passed her mood had changed in a flash or seemed to have changed the stream babbled on over the stones again be careful jimmy you nearly touched me with the spoon i don't want to be covered with that horrible stuff look at that poor little chicken out there in the cold it hasn't had a morsel jimmy responded to her lead there was nothing else for him to do it's in luck he said give it a spoonful it can have one if it likes but it's taking big risks here you are hercules pitch in he scraped the last spoonful out of the iron pot, and they began to walk back to the house. "'You're very quiet, Jimmy,' said Molly. "'I was thinking. What about?' "'Lots of things. New York?' "'That, among others.' "'Dear old New York,' said Molly, with a little sigh. "'I'm not sure it wasn't. I mean, I sometimes wish—oh, you know—' i mean it's lovely here but it was nice in the old days wasn't it jimmy it's a pity that things change isn't it it depends what do you mean i don't mind things changing if people don't do you think i've changed you said i hadn't when we met in the road you haven't as far as looks go have i changed in other ways jimmy looked at her i don't know he said slowly they were in the hall now. Keggs had just left after beating the dressing gong. The echoes of it still lingered. Molly paused on the bottom step. I haven't, Jimmy, she said, and ran on up the stairs. Chapter 7 Jimmy dressed for dinner in a very exalted frame of mind that night. It seemed to him that he had awakened from a sort of a stupor life was so much fuller of possibilities than he had imagined a few days back the sudden acquisition of his uncle's money had in a manner brought him to a halt till then the exhilarating feeling of having his hand against the world had lent a zest to life there had been no monotony there had always been obstacles one may hardly perhaps dilate on the joys of toil in connection with him considering the precise methods by which he had supported himself. But nevertheless, his emotions when breaking the law of the United States had been akin to those of the honest worker, in so far that his operations had satisfied the desire for action which possesses every man of brains and energy. They had given him something to do. 
He had felt alive. His uncle's legacy had left him with a sensation of abrupt stoppage. Life had suddenly become aimless. But now everything was altered. Once more the future was a thing of importance, tomorrow a day to be looked forward to with keen expectation. He tried to throw his mind back to the last occasion when he had seen Molly. He could not remember that he had felt any excessive emotion. Between camaraderie and love there is a broad gulf. It had certainly never been bridged in the old New York days. When the frank friendliness of which the American girl appears to have the monopoly had been Molly's chief charm in his eyes, it had made possible a comradeship such as might have existed between men. But now there was a difference. England seemed to have brought about a subtle change in her. Instinctively he felt that the old friendship, adequate before, was not enough now. He wanted more. The unexpected meeting, following so closely upon Spike's careless words in London, had shown him his true feelings. Misgivings crept upon him. Had he a right? Was it fair? He looked back at the last eight years of his life with the eye of an impartial judge. He saw them stripped of the glamour which triumphant cunning had lent them, saw them as they would appear to Molly. He scowled at his reflection in the glass. "'You've been a bad lot, my son,' he said. "'There's only one thing in your favour, and that is the fact that you've cut it all out for keeps. We must be content with that.' There was a furtive rap at the door. "'Hello?' said Jimmy. "'Yes?' The door opened slowly. A grin, surmounted by a mop of red hair, appeared around the edge of it. "'Well, Spike, come in. What's the matter?' The rest of Mr. Mullins entered the room. "'Gee, Mr. James, I wasn't sure that this was your room. Say, who do you think I nearly bumped into me Coco again and out in the corridor? Why, old man McEachern, de cop. That's right. "'Yes?' Sure. Say, what's he doing on this beat? You's could have knocked me down with a bit of poiver when I seen him. I pretty near went down and out. That's right. Me heart ain't got back home yet. Did he recognize you? Sure. He starts like an actor on top of the stage when he sees he's up against the plot to ruin him, and he gives me the fierce eye. Well? I was wondering, was I on Third Avenue? Or was I standing on me coco, or what was I doing anyhow? Then I slips off and chases meself up here. Say, Mr. James, can yous put me wise? What's the game? What's old man McEachern doing stunts this side for? It's all right, Spike. Keep calm. I can explain. Mr. McEachern owns the house. On your way, Mr. James. What's that? This is his house we're in now. He left the force three years ago, came over here, and bought this place. And here we are again, all gathered together under the same roof, like a jolly little family party. Spike's open mouth bore witness to his amazement. Then all this. Belongs to him? That's it. We are his guests, Spike. But what's he going to do? I couldn't say. I'm expecting to hear shortly. But we needn't worry ourselves. The next move's with him. If he wants to say anything about it, he must come to me. Sure, it's up to him, agreed Spike. I'm quite comfortable. Speaking for myself, I'm having a good time. How are you getting on downstairs? De limit, Mr. James. Honest, I'm on pink velvet. Dey's an old gazebo, de butler. Keggs his name is. That's the best ever at handing out long oids. I sit and listen. They calls me Mr. Mullins down there, said Spike with pride. Good. I'm glad you're all right. There's no reason why we shouldn't have an excellent time here. I don't think that Mr. McEachern will turn us out, after he's heard one or two little things I have to say to him. Just a few reminiscences of the past which may interest him. I have the greatest affection for Mr. McEachern, though he did club me once with his nightstick. But nothing shall make me stir from here for the next week, at any rate. 
"'Not on your life,' agreed Spike. "'Say, Mr. James, he must have got a lot of punks to bite his place. And I know he's got em too. That's right. I comes from old New York myself. Hush, Spike, this is scandal. Sure, said the Bowery boy doggedly, securely mounted now on his favorite hobby horse. I knows and you knows, Mr. James. Gee, I wish I'd been a cop. But I wasn't tall enough. They's de fellers with de long green in their banks. Look at dis old McEachern. Money to boin a wet dog with. He's got and never a bit of oink for it from de start to de finish. And look at me, Mr. James. I do, Spike, I do. Look at me, getting busy all the year round, working to beat the band all. In prisons oft, said Jimmy. That's right. And chased all round the town. And then what? Why, to the bad at the end of it all. Say, it's enough to make a feller. Turn honest, said Jimmy. You've hit it, Spike. You'll be glad some day that you reformed. But on this point Spike seemed to be doubtful. He was silent for a moment. Then, as if following upon a train of thoughts, he said, Mr. James, this is a fine big house. Splendid. Say, couldn't we? Spike, said Jimmy warningly. Well, couldn't we? said Spike doggedly. It ain't often use butts into a dead easy proposition like this one. We shouldn't have to do a thing except get busy. The stuff's just lying about, Mr. James. I have noticed it. Ah, it's a waste to leave it. Spike, said Jimmy, I warned you of this. I begged you to be on your guard, to fight against your professional instincts, and you must do it. I know it's hard, but it's got to be done. Try and occupy your mind. Collect butterflies. Spike shuffled in gloomy silence. Remember those jewels we got into hotel the year before I was copped? He asked at length, irrelevantly. Jimmy finished tying his tie, looked at the result for a moment in the glass, then replied, Yes, I remember. We got another key that fitted the door. Remember that? Jimmy nodded. And some of those knockout drops. What's that? Chloroform. That's right. And we didn't do a thing else. And we live for the rest of the year on those jewels. Spike paused. That was too de good, he said wistfully. Jimmy made no reply. There's a loity here, continued Spike, addressing the chest of drawers, that's got a necklace of jewels that's worth two hundred thousand plunks. I know. Silence again. Two hundred thousand plunks, breathed Spike. What a necklace, thought Jimmy. Keggs told me dat. The old gazebo what hands out de long woids. I could find out whether they're kept dead easy. What a king of necklaces, thought Jimmy. Shall I, Mr. James? Shall you what? asked Jimmy, coming out of his thoughts with a start. Why, find out where de loidy keeps de jewels. Confound you, Spike! How often am I to tell you that I have done with all that sort of thing forever? I never want to see or touch another stone that doesn't belong to me. I don't want to hear about them. They don't interest me. Sorry, Mr. James, but they must cop the limit for fair, those jewels. Two hundred thousand plunks. What's that this side? Forty thousand pounds, said Jimmy shortly. Now drop it. Yes, Mr. James. Can I help you with the duds? No, thanks, Spike. I'm through now. You might just give me a brush down, though, if you don't mind. Not that. That's a hairbrush. Try the big black one. This is a dude suit for fair, observed Spike, pausing in his labors. Glad you like it, Spike. It's the limit. Excuse me. How much of the long green did you spunkle for it, Mr. James? I really can't remember, said Jimmy with a laugh. I could look up the bill and let you know. Seventy guineas, I fancy. What's that, guineas? Is that more than a pound? A shilling more. Why? Spike resumed his brushing. What a lot of dude suits yous could get, he observed meditatively. 
if you's had those jewels oh curse the jewels for the hundredth time snapped jimmy yes mr james but say dat must be a boy of a necklace dat one you'll be seeing it at de dinner mr james whatever comment jimmy might have made on this insidious statement was checked by a sudden bang on the door almost simultaneously the handle turned peachy cried spike it's de cop jimmy smiled pleasantly come in mr mckeechern he said come in journeys end in lovers meeting you know my friend mr mullins i think shut the door and sit down and let's talk of many things chapter eight it's a conspiracy thundered mr mckeechern he stood in the doorway breathing heavily it has been shown that the ex-policeman was somewhat prone to harbor suspicions of those round about him and at the present moment his mind was aflame indeed a more trusting man might have been excused for feeling a little doubtful as to the intentions of jimmy and spike when mckeechern had heard that his stepson had brought home a casual london acquaintance he had suspected the existence of hidden motives on the part of the unknown spenny he had told himself was precisely the sort of youth to whom the professional bunco steerer would attach himself with shouts of joy never he had assured himself had there been a softer proposition than his stepson since bunco steering became a profession when he found that the strange visitor was jimmy pitt his suspicions had increased a thousandfold and when going to his dressing-room to get ready for dinner he had nearly run into spike mullins red spike of shameful memory his frame of mind had been that of a man to whom a sudden ray of light reveals the fact that he is on the very brink of a black precipice jimmy and spike had been a firm in new york and here they were together again in his house in shropshire to say that the thing struck mckeechern as sinister is to put the matter baldly there was once a gentleman who remarked that he smelled a rat and saw it floating in the air ex-constable mckeechern smelled a regiment of rats and the air seemed to him positively congested with them his first impulse had been to rush to jimmy's room there and then but lady jane had trained him well though the heavens might fall he must not be late for dinner so he went and dressed and an obstinate tie put the finishing touches to his wrath jimmy regarded him coolly without moving from the chair in which he had seated himself spike on the other hand seemed embarrassed he stood first on one leg and then on the other as if he were testing the respective merits of each and would make a definite choice later on ye scoundrels growled mckeechern spike who had been standing for a few moments on his right leg and seemed at last to have come to a decision hastily changed to the left and grinned feebly say yous won't want me any more mr james he whispered no you can go spike ye stay where ye are you red-headed limb run along spike said jimmy the bowery boy looked doubtful at the huge form of the ex-policeman which blocked access to the door would you mind letting my man pass said jimmy ye stay began mckeechern jimmy got up and walked round him to the door which he opened spike shot out like a rabbit released from a trap he was not lacking in courage but he disliked embarrassing interviews and it struck him that mr james was the man to handle a situation of this kind he felt that he himself would only be in the way now we can talk comfortably said jimmy going back to his chair mckeechern's deep-set eyes gleamed and his forehead grew red but he mastered his feelings and now said he perhaps you'll explain what exactly asked jimmy what you're doing here nothing at the moment ye know what i mean why are ye here you and that red-headed devil he jerked his head in the direction of the door i am here because i was very kindly invited to come by your stepson i know ye you have that privilege i know ye i say and i want to know what you're here to do to do well i shall potter about the garden don't you know and smell the roses 
and look at the horses and feed the chickens and perhaps go for an occasional row on the lake nothing more oh yes i believe they want me to act in these theatricals and i'll tell ye another thing ye'll be wanted to do and that is to go away from here at once my dear old sir ye hear me at once i couldn't think of it said jimmy decidedly not for a moment i'll expose ye stormed mckeechern i'll expose ye will ye deny that ye was a crook in new york what proofs have you proofs will you deny it no it's quite true i knew it but i'm a reformed character now mr mckeechern i have money of my own it was left me i hear you had money left you too i did said mckeechern shortly congratulate you i'm glad to know because otherwise i might have formed quite a wrong impression when i came here and found you with money to burn quite the old english squire now mr mckeechern what you'll leave the house to-morrow all the more reason why we should make the most of this opportunity of talking over old times did you mind leaving the force and you'll take that blackguard mullins with ye judging from the stories one hears it must be a jolly sort of life what a pity so many of them go in for graft i could tell you some stories about a policeman i used to know in new york he was the champion grafter i remember hearing one yarn from a newspaper man out there this reporter chap happened to hear the grumblings of some tenants of an apartment house uptown which led them to believe that certain noises they complained of were made by burglars who used the flat as a place to pack up the loot for shipment to other cities you know that habit of ours don't you he was quite right and when he tipped off his newspaper they reported the thing to the police now i could have gone right up and made those men show up their hands by merely asking them to not so the police i wonder if you remember the case you look as if you were beginning to the police went blundering at wrong doors and most of the gang got away and while they were in the house after the raid a woman was able to slip in and take away on an express wagon the three trunks which were to have been held for evidence and that's not all either there was one particular policeman who held the case for the prosecution in his hands if he had played up in court next day the one man that had been captured would have got all that was coming to him what happened why his evidence broke down and the man was discharged it's a long story i hope it hasn't bored you mckeechern did not look bored he was mopping his forehead and breathing quickly it was a most interesting case said jimmy i've got all the names it's a lie not at all true as anything ever heard of that policeman i've got his name too who made a lot of money by getting appointments in the force for men of his acquaintance he used to be paid heavily for it and you'd hardly believe what a lot of scoundrels he let in in that way see here began mckeechern huskily i wonder if you ever came across any men in the force who made anything by that dodge of arresting a person and then getting a lawyer for them ever heard of that it's rather like a double rough at bridge you i'm awfully sorry i shouldn't have used that word what i meant to say was the policeman makes his arrest then suggests that the person had better have a bondsman he gathers in a bondsman who charges the prisoner four dollars for bailing him out two dollars of this goes to the sergeant who accepts the bail without question and the policeman takes one then the able and intelligent officer says to the prisoner what you want is a lawyer right says the prisoner if you think so off goes the policeman and gets the lawyer five more dollars of which he gets his share it's a beautiful system it might interest the people at dinner tonight to hear about it i think i'll tell them yo and when you come to think that some policemen in new york take tribute from peddlers who obstruct the traffic tradesmen who obstruct the sidewalk restaurant keepers who keep open after one o'clock in the morning drivers who exceed speed limits and keepers of pool rooms 
you'll understand that there's a good bit to be made out of graft if you go in for it seriously it's uncommonly lucky mckeechern that you were left that money otherwise you might have been tempted mightn't you there was a somewhat breathless silence in the room mr mckeechern was panting slightly you couldn't reconsider your decision about sending me away tomorrow i suppose said jimmy flicking at his shoes with a handkerchief it's a lovely part of the country this i would be sorry to leave it mr mckeechern's brain was working with unwonted rapidity this man must be silenced at all costs it would be fatal to his prospects in english society if one tithe of these gruesome stories were made public and he believed jimmy capable of making them public being guilty thereby of an error of judgment jimmy though he had no respect at all for mr mckeechern would have died sooner than spread any story which even in an indirect way could reflect upon molly mr mckeechern however had not the advantage of knowing his antagonist's feelings and the bluff was successful ye can stay he said thanks said jimmy and i'll beg ye not to mention the force at dinner or at any other time i won't dream of it they think i made me money on wall street it would have been a slower job there you were wise in your choice shall we go down to the drawing-room now ye say you're rich yourself said mckeechern very said jimmy so don't worry yourself my wall street speculator mr mckeechern did not worry himself he had just recollected that in a very short time he would have a trained detective on the premises any looking after that james willoughby pitt might require might safely be left in the hands of this expert chapter nine it was at dinner that jimmy had his first chance of seeing the rope of pearls which had so stimulated the roving fancy of spike mullins lady blunt sat almost opposite to him her dress was of unrelieved black and formed a wonderfully effective foil to the gems it was not a rope of pearls it was a collar her neck was covered with them there was something oriental and barbaric in the overwhelming display of jewelry and this suggestion of the east was emphasized by the wearer's regal carriage lady blunt knew when she looked well she did not hold herself like one apologizing for venturing to exist jimmy stared hungrily across the table the room was empty to him but for that gleaming mass of gems he breathed softly and quickly through clenched teeth jimmy whispered a voice it seemed infinitely remote a hand shook his elbow gently he started don't stare like that please what is the matter molly seated at his side was looking at him wide-eyed jimmy smiled with an effort every nerve in his body seemed to be writhing sorry he said i'm only hungry i always look like that at the beginning of a meal well here comes kegs with some soup for you you'd better not waste another moment you look perfectly awful no like a starved wolf you must look after me said jimmy see that the wolf's properly fed the conversation becoming general with the fish was not of a kind to remove from jimmy's mind the impression made by the sight of the pearls it turned on crime in general and burglary in particular spenny began it oh i say he said i forgot to tell you mother number six was burgled the other night number six a easton square was the family's london house burgled well broken into said spenny gratified to find that he had got the ear of his entire audience even lady blunt was silent and attentive chap got in through the scullery window about one o'clock in the morning it was the night after you dined with me pitt and what did our spenny do inquired sir thomas oh i er i was out at the time said spenny but something frightened the feller and he went on hurriedly and he made a bolt for it without taking anything jimmy looking down the table became conscious that his host's eye was fixed gloomily upon him he knew intuitively what was passing in mckeechern's mind 
the ex-policeman was feeling that his worst suspicions had been confirmed. Jimmy had dined with Spenny, obviously a mere excuse for spying out the land, and the very next night the house had been burgled. Once more Mr. McEachern congratulated himself on his astuteness in engaging the detective from Rag's agency. With Jimmy above stairs and Spike Mullins below, that sleuth-hound would have his hands full. "'Burglary,' said Wesson, leaning back and taking advantage of a pause, "'is the hobby of the sportsman and the life-work of the avaricious. "'Everybody seemed to have something to say on the subject. "'One young lady gave it as her opinion that she would not like to find a burglar under her bed. "'Somebody else had known a man whose father had fired at the butler, "'under the impression that he was a housebreaker, "'and had broken a valuable bust of Socrates.' Spenny knew a man at Oxford whose brother wrote lyrics for musical comedy, and had done one about a burglar's best friend being his mother. Life, said Wesson, who had had time for reflection, is a house which we all burgle. We enter it uninvited, take all we can lay hands on, and go out again. This man's brother I was telling you about, said Spenny, says there's only one rhyme in the English language to burglar, and that's gurgler. Unless you count pergola, he says. Personally, said Jimmy, with a glance at McEachern, I have rather a sympathy for burglars. After all, they are one of the hardest working classes in existence. They toil while everybody else is asleep. They are generally thorough sportsmen. Besides, a burglar is only a practical socialist. Philosophers talk a lot about the redistribution of wealth. The burglar goes out and does it. I have found burglars some of the decentest criminals I've ever met. Out of business hours they are charming. I despise burglars, ejaculated Lady Blunt, with a suddenness which stopped Jimmy's eloquence as if a tap had been turned off. If I found one coming after my jewels and I had a gun handy, I'd shoot him. I would. "'My dear Julia,' said Lady Jane, "'why suggest such dreadful things? "'At any rate, this house has never been burgled, "'and I don't think it's likely to be.' "'Be roofin', said Jimmy, touching the back of his chair. "'As he did so, he met McEachern's eye, "'and smiled kindly at him. "'The ex-policeman was looking at him "'with a gaze of a baffled but malignant basilisk. "'I take very good care no one gets a chance at my jewels,' said Lady Blunt. "'I've had a steel box made for me with a special lock "'which would drive the cunningest burglar on this earth mad "'before he'd been at it ten minutes. "'It would. He'd go right away and reform.' "'Jimmy's lips closed tightly, "'and a combative look came into his eye at this unconscious challenge. "'This woman was too aggressively confident.' A small lesson. He could turn the jewels by post. It would give her a much-needed jolt. Then he pulled himself up. James, my boy, he said to himself with severity, this is hypocrisy. You know perfectly well that is not why you want those pearls. Don't try and bluff yourself, because it won't do. The conversation turned to other topics. Jimmy was glad of it. He wanted to think this thing over. From where he sat, he had an excellent view of the rope of pearls which was tugging him back to his old ways. And when he looked at them, he could not see Molly. The thing was symbolical. It must be one or the other. He was at a crossroads. The affair was becoming a civil war. He felt like a rudderless boat between two currents. Eight years of gem collecting do not leave a man without a deep-rooted passion for the sport. As for that steel box, that was all nonsense. It was probably quite a good steel box, and a lock might very well be something out of the ordinary, but it could not be a harder job than some of those he had tackled. The pearls shone in the lamplight. They seemed to be winking at him. Chapter 10 in a cozy corner of the electric flame department of the infernal regions there stands a little silver gridiron. It is the private property of his satanic majesty, and is reserved exclusively for the man who invented amateur theatricals. 
it is hard to see why the amateur actor has been allowed to work his will unchecked for so long these performances of his are diametrically opposed to the true sport of civilization which insists that the good of the many should be considered as being of more importance than that of the few in the case of amateur theatricals a large number of inoffensive people are annoyed simply in order that a mere handful of acquaintances may amuse themselves usually the whole thing can be laid at the door of the man the organizer he is the serpent in the eden before his arrival the house party were completely happy and asked for nothing else but to be left alone then he arrives at breakfast on his first morning he strikes the first blow casually helping himself to scrambled eggs the while with the air of a man uttering some agreeable commonplace i say he remarks why not get up some theatricals eve in the person of some young lady who would be a drawing-room reciter if drawing-room reciters were allowed nowadays snatches at the apple oh yes she says it ought to be for a charity suggests somebody else of course for a charity says the serpent ten minutes later he has revealed the fact that he has brought down a little thing of his own which will just do and is casting the parts and after that the man who loves peace and quiet may as well pack up and leave he will have no more rest in that house in the present case the serpent was a volatile young gentleman of the name of charteris this indomitable person had the love of the stage ineradicably implanted in him he wrote plays and lived in hopes of seeing them staged at the leading theatres meanwhile he was content to bring them out through the medium of amateur performances it says much for the basic excellence of this man's character that he was popular among his fellows who liking the man overlooked the amateur stage manager the reign of unrest at the abbey was complete by the time jimmy arrived there the preliminary rehearsals had been gone through with by the company who being inexperienced imagined the worst to be over having hustled jimmy into the vacant part charteris gave his energy free play he conducted rehearsals with a vigor which occasionally almost welded the rabble which he was coaching into something approaching coherency he never rested he painted scenery and left it about wet and people sat on it he nailed up horseshoes for luck and they fell on people he distributed parts of the play among the company and they lost them but nothing daunted him mr charteris said lady blunt after one somewhat energetic rehearsal is indefatigable he whirled me about this was perhaps his greatest triumph that he had induced lady blunt to take part in the piece her first remark on being asked had been to the effect that she despised acting golden eloquence on the part of the author manager had induced her to modify this opinion and finally she had consented on the understanding that she was not to be expected to attend every rehearsal to play a small part the only drawback to an otherwise attractive scheme was the fact that she would not be able to wear her jewels secretly she would have given much to have done so but the scene in which she was to appear was a daylight scene in which the most expensive necklace would be out of place so she had given up the idea with a stoicism that showed her to be of the stuff of which heroines are made these same jewels had ceased after their first imperious call to trouble jimmy to the extent he had anticipated it had been a bitter struggle during the first few days of his stay but gradually he had fought the craving down and now watched them across the dinner table at night with a calm which filled him with self-righteousness on the other hand he was uncomfortably alive to the fact that this triumph of his might be merely temporary there the gems were winking and beckoning to him across the table at any moment when his thoughts arrived at this point he would turn them an effort was sometimes necessary to molly thinking of her he forgot the pearls but the process of thinking of molly was not one of unmixed comfort a great uneasiness had gripped him 
more than ever as the days went by he knew that he loved her that now the old easy friendship was a mockery but on her side he could see no signs that she desired a change in their relationship she was still the old molly of the new york days frank cheerful unembarrassed but he found that in this new world of hers the opportunities of getting her to himself for any space of time were infinitesimal it was her unfortunate conviction bred of her american upbringing that the duty of the hostess is to see that her guests enjoy themselves lady jane held the english view that visitors like to be left to themselves and molly noticing her stepmother's lack of enterprise and putting it down as merely another proof of her languid nature had exerted herself all the more keenly to do the honors the consequence was that jimmy found himself one of a crowd and disliked the sensation the thing was becoming intolerable here was he a young man in love kept from proposing simply by a series of ridiculous obstacles it could not go on he must get her away somewhere by himself not for a few minutes as he had been doing up to the present but for a solid space of time it was after a long and particularly irritating rehearsal that the idea of the lake suggested itself to him the rehearsals took place in one of the upper rooms and through the window as he leaned gloomily against the wall listening to a homily on the drama from charteris he could see the waters of the lake lit up by the afternoon sun it had been a terribly hot oppressive day and there was thunder in the air the rehearsal had bored everybody unspeakably it would be heavenly on the lake thought jimmy there was a canadian canoe moored to that willow if he could only get molly i'm awfully sorry jimmy said molly as they walked out into the garden i should love to come it would be too perfect but i've half promised to play tennis who wants to play mr wesson a correspondent of a london daily paper wrote to his editor not long ago to complain that there was a wave of profanity passing over the country jimmy added a silent but heartfelt contribution to that wave give him the slip he said earnestly it was the chance of a lifetime a unique chance perhaps his last chance and it was to be lost for the sake of an ass like wesson molly looked doubtful well come down to the water and have a look at it said jimmy that'll be better than nothing they walked to the water's edge together in silence jimmy in a fever of anxiety he looked behind him no signs of wesson yet all might still be well it does look nice jimmy doesn't it said molly placing a foot on the side of the boat and rocking it gently come on jimmy said hoarsely give him the slip get in molly looked round hesitatingly well oh bother there he is and he's seen me jimmy followed her gaze the dapper figure of mr wesson was moving down the lawn he had a tennis racket in his hand his face wore an inviting smile jimmy glared at him hopelessly mr wesson had vanished now behind the great clump of laurels which stood on the lowest terrace in another moment he would reappear round them bother said molly again jimmy for gently but with extreme firmness and dispatch jimmy who ought to have known better had seized her hand on the other side of the waist swung her off her feet and placed her carefully on the cushions in the bow of the canoe then he had jumped in himself with a force which made the boat rock and was now paddling with the silent energy of a dangerous lunatic into the middle of the lake while mr wesson who had by this time rounded the laurels stood transfixed gazing glassily after the retreating vessel to the casual spectator he might have seemed stricken dumb but at the end of the first ten seconds any fear that the casual spectator might have entertained as to the permanence of the seizure would have been relieved chapter eleven the man who lays a hand upon a woman said jimmy paddling strongly save in the way of kindness i'm very sorry molly but you didn't seem to be able to make up your mind you aren't angry are you 
there was a brief pause while molly apparently debated the matter in her mind you wouldn't take me back even if i were angry she said you have guessed it said jimmy approvingly do you read much poetry molly why i was only thinking how neatly some of these poets put a thing the chap who said distance lends enchantment to the view for instance take the case of wesson he looks quite nice when you see him at a distance like this with a good strip of water in between mr wesson was still standing in a statuesque attitude on the bank molly gazing over the side of the boat into the lake abstained from feasting her eyes on the picturesque spectacle jolly the water looks said jimmy i was just thinking it looked rather dirty beastly agreed jimmy the water as a topic of conversation dried up mr wesson had started now to leave the stricken field there was a reproachful look about his back which harassed molly's sensitive conscience jimmy on the other hand men being of coarser fiber than women especially as to the conscience appeared in no way distressed at the sight you oughtn't need have done it jimmy said molly i had to there seemed to be no other way of ever getting you by yourself for five minutes at a stretch you're always in the middle of a crowd nowadays but i must look after my guests not a bit of it let em rip why should they monopolize you it will be awfully unpleasant meeting mr wesson after this it is always unpleasant meeting wesson i shan't know what to say don't say anything i shan't be able to look him in the face that's a bit of luck for you you aren't much help jimmy the subject of wesson doesn't inspire me somehow i don't know why besides you've simply got to say you changed your mind you're a woman it's expected of you i feel awfully mean what you want to do is to take your thoughts off the business keep your mind occupied with something else then you'll forget all about it keep talking to me about things that's the plan there are heaps of subjects the weather for instance as a start hot isn't it we're going to have a storm there's a sort of feel in the air we'd better go back i think tush and possibly bah said jimmy digging the paddle into the water we've only just started i say who was that man i saw you talking to after lunch how soon after lunch just before the rehearsal he was with your father short chap with a square face dressed in gray i hadn't seen him before oh that was mr gaylor a new york friend of father's did you know him out in new york i didn't but he seems to know father very well what's his name did you say gaylor samuel gaylor did you ever hear of him never but there were several people in new york i didn't know how did your father meet him over here he was stopping at the inn in the village and he'd heard about the abbey being so old so he came over to look at it and the first person he met was father he's going to stay in the house now the cart was sent down for his things this afternoon did you feel a spot of rain then i wish you'd paddle back not a drop that storm's not coming till tonight why it's a gorgeous evening he turned the nose of the boat toward the island which lay cool and green and mysterious in the middle of the lake the heat was intense the sun as if conscious of having only a brief spell of work before it blazed fiercely with the apparent intention of showing what it could do before the rain came the air felt curiously parched there said molly surely you felt something then i did is there time to get back before it begins no we shall get soaked not a bit of it on the other side of the island there is a handy little boathouse sort of place we'll put in there the boathouse was simply a little creek covered over with boards and capable of sheltering an ordinary rowing boat jimmy ran the canoe in just as the storm began and turned her broadside on so that they could watch the rain which was sweeping over the lake in sheets 
Just in time, he said, shipping the paddle. Snug in here, isn't it? We should have got wet in another minute. I hope it won't last long. I hope it will, because I've got something very important to say to you, and I don't want to have to hurry it. Are you quite comfortable? Yes, thanks. I don't know how to put it exactly. I mean, I don't want to offend you or anything. What I mean to say is, do you mind if I smoke? Thanks. I don't know why it is, but I always talk easier if I've got a cigarette going. He rolled one with great deliberation and care. Molly watched him admiringly. You're the only man I've ever seen roll a cigarette properly, Jimmy, she said. Everybody else leaves them all flabby at the ends. I learned the trick from a little Italian who kept a clothing store in the Bowery. It was the only useful thing he could do. Look at the rain. Jimmy leaned forward. Molly. I wonder if poor Mr. Wesson got indoors before it began. I do hope he did. Jimmy sat back again. He scowled. Every man is liable on occasion to behave like a sulky schoolboy. Jimmy did so. You seem to spend most of your time thinking about Wesson, he said savagely. Molly had begun to hum a tune to herself as she watched the rain. She stopped. A profound and ghastly silence brooded over the canoe. Molly, said Jimmy at last, I'm sorry. No reply. Molly. Well? I'm sorry. Molly turned. I wish you wouldn't say things like that, Jimmy. It hurts from you. He could see that there were tears in her eyes. Molly, don't. She turned her head away once more. I can't help it, Jimmy. It hurts. Everything is so changed. I'm miserable. You wouldn't have said a thing like that in the old days. Molly, if you knew... It's all right, Jimmy. It was silly of me. I'm all right now. The rain has stopped. Let's go back, shall we? Not yet. For God's sake, not yet. This is my only chance. Directly we get back, it will be the same miserable business all over again, the same that it's been every day since I came to this place. Heavens! When you first told me that you were living at the Abbey, I was absolutely happy, like a fool. I might have known how it would be. Every day there's a crowd round you. I never get a chance of talking to you. I consider myself lucky if you speak a couple of words to me. If I'd known the slow torture it was going to be, I'd have taken the next train back to London. I can't stand it. Molly, you remember what friends we were in the old days. Was it ever anything more with you? Was it? Is it now? I was very fond of you, Jimmy. He could hardly hear the words. Was it ever anything more than that? Is it now? That was three years ago. You were a child. We were just good friends then. I don't want friendship now. It's not enough. I want you. You. You were right a moment ago. Everything has changed. For me, at least. Has it for you? Has it for you, Molly? On the island a thrush had begun to sing. Molly raised her head as if to listen. The water lapped against the sides of the canoe. Has it, Molly? She bent over and dabbled one finger in the water. I... I think it has, Jimmy, she whispered. Chapter 12 The Honorable Lewis Wesson, meanwhile, having left the waterside, lit a cigarette, and proceeded to make a moody tour of the grounds. He felt aggrieved with the world. One is never at one's best and sunniest when a rival has performed a brilliant and successful piece of cutting out work beneath one's very eyes. Something of a jaundiced tinge stains one's outlook on life in such circumstances. Mr. Wesson did not pretend to himself that he was violently in love with Molly, but he certainly admired her, and intended, unless he changed his mind later on, to marry her. He walked, drawing thoughtfully at his cigarette. The more he reviewed the late episode, the less he liked it. 
he had not seen jimmy put molly in the canoe and her departure seemed to him a deliberate desertion she had promised to play tennis with him and at the last moment she had gone off with this fellow pitt who was pitt he was always in the way shoving himself in at this moment a large warm raindrop fell on his hand from the bushes all round came an ever-increasing patter the sky was leaden he looked round him for shelter he had reached the rose garden in the course of his perambulations at the far end was a summer house he turned up his coat collar and ran as he drew near he heard a slow and dirge-like whistling proceeding from the interior plunging in out of breath just as the deluge began he found spenny seated at a little wooden table with an earnest expression on his face the table was covered with cards how jim took exercise said spenny glancing up hello wesson by jove isn't it coming down with which greeting he turned his attention to his cards once more he took one from the pack in his left hand looked at it hesitated for a moment as if doubtful whereabouts on the table it would produce the most artistic effect and finally put it down face upward then he moved another card from the table and put it on top of the other one throughout the performance he whistled painfully wesson regarded him with disfavor that looks damn exciting he said he reserved his more polished periods for use in public what are you playing at what said spenny abstractedly dealing another card oh don't just sit there looking like a frog said wesson irritably talk man what's the matter what do you want hello i've done it no i haven't no luck at all haven't brought up a demon all day he gathered up the cards and began to shuffle ah love he sang sentimentally with a vacant eye on the roof of the summer-house could i but tell thee how much oh stop it said wesson you seem depressed laddie what's the matter ah love could i but tell thee spenny who is this fellow pitt jimmy pitt pal of mine one of the absolute i nutty to the core good my lord ah love could i but tell where did you meet him london why he and your sister seem pretty good friends i shouldn't wonder knew each other out in america bridge 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 a capital game for two shuffle and cut and deal away and let the loser pay bridge well let's have a game then anything for something to do curse this rain we shall be cooped up here till dinner at this rate double dummy's a frightfully rotten game said spenny ever played piquet i could teach it to you in five minutes a look of almost awe came into wesson's face the look of one who sees a miracle performed before his eyes for years he had been using all the large stock of diplomacy at his command to induce callow youths to play piquet with him and here was this admirable young man this pearl among young men positively offering to teach him it was too much happiness what had he done to deserve this he felt as a toil-worn lion might have felt if an antelope instead of making its customary bee-line for the horizon had expressed a friendly hope that it would be found tender and inserted its head between its jaws i it's very good of you i shouldn't mind being shown the idea he listened attentively while spenny explained at some length the principles which govern the game of piquet every now and then he asked a question it was evident that he was beginning to grasp the idea of the game what exactly is repiquet he asked as spenny paused it's like this said spenny returning to his lecture yes i see now said the neophyte they began playing spenny as was only to be expected in a contest between teacher and student won the first two hands wesson won the next i've got the hang of it all right now he said complacently it's a simple sort of game make it more exciting don't you think if we played for something all right said spenny slowly if you like 
he would not have suggested it himself but after all hang it if the man simply asked for it it was not his fault if the winning of a hand should give the fellow the impression that he knew all there was to be known about piquet of course piquet was a game where skill was practically bound to win but after all wesson had plenty of money he could afford it all right said spinney again how much something fairly moderate ten bob a hundred there is no doubt that spinney ought at this suggestion to have corrected the novice's notion that ten shillings a hundred was fairly moderate he knew that it was possible for a poor player to lose four hundred points in a twenty-minute game and usual for him to lose two hundred but he let the thing go very well he said twenty minutes later mr wesson was looking somewhat ruefully at the score sheet i owe you eighteen shillings he said shall i pay you now or shall we settle up in a lump after we've finished what about stopping now said spinney it's quite fine out no let's go on i've nothing to do till dinner and i'm sure you haven't spinney's conscience made one last effort you'd much better stop you know wesson really he said you can lose a frightful lot at this game my dear spenny said wesson stiffly i can look after myself thanks of course if you think you are risking too much by all means oh if you don't mind said spenny outraged i'm only too frightfully pleased only remember i warned you i'll bear it in mind by the way before we start care to make it a sovereign a hundred spinney could not afford to play piquet for a sovereign hundred or anything like it but after his adversary's innuendo it was impossible for a young gentleman of spirit to admit the humiliating fact he nodded it's about time i fancy said mr wesson looking at his watch an hour later that we are going in to dress for dinner spinney made no reply he was wrapped in thought let's see that's twenty pounds you owe me isn't it continued mr wesson no hurry of course any time you like shocking bad luck you had they went out into the rose garden jolly everything smells after the rain said mr wesson freshened everything up spenny did not appear to have noticed it he seemed to be thinking of something else his air was pensive and abstracted chapter thirteen the emotions of a man who has just proposed and been accepted are complex and overwhelming a certain stunned sensation is perhaps predominant blended with this relief the relief of a general who has brought a difficult campaign to a successful end or of a member of a forlorn hope who finds that the danger is over and he is still alive to this must be added a newly born sense of magnificence of finding oneself to be without having known it the devil of a fellow we have dimly suspected perhaps from time to time that we were something rather out of the ordinary run of men but there has always been a haunting fear that this view was to be attributed to a personal bias in our own favor when however our suspicion is suddenly confirmed by the only judge for whose opinion we have the least respect our bosom heaves with complacency and the world has nothing more to offer with some accepted suitors there is an alloy of apprehension in the metal of their happiness and the strain of an engagement sometimes brings with it even a faint shadow of regret she makes me buy new clothes one swain in the third quarter of his engagement was overheard to moan to a friend two new ties only yesterday he seemed to be debating within himself whether human nature could stand the strain but whatever tragedies may cloud the end of the period its beginning at least is bathed in sunshine jimmy regarding his lathered face in the glass as he dressed for dinner that night called himself the luckiest man on earth and wondered if he were worthy of such happiness thinking it over he came to the conclusion that he was not but that all the same he meant to have it no doubt distressed him it might have occurred to him that the relations between mr mcechern and himself offered a very serious bar to his prospects 
but in his present frame of mind he declined to consider the existence of the ex-constable at all. In a world that contained Molly there was no room for other people. They were not in the picture. They did not exist. There are men in the world who, through long custom, can find themselves engaged without any particular whirl of emotion. King Solomon probably belonged to this class and even Henry the Eighth must have become a trifle blasé in time. But to the average man, the novice, the fact of being accepted seems to divide existence into two definite parts, before and after. A sensitive conscience goads some into compiling a full and unexpurgated autobiography, the edition limited to one copy, which is presented to the lady most interested. Some men find a melancholy pleasure in these confessions. They like to draw the girl of their affections aside and have a long, cozy chat about what scoundrels they were before they met her. But, after all, the past is past, and cannot be altered, and it is to be supposed that, whatever we may have done in that checkered period, we tend to behave ourselves for the future. So why harp on it? Jimmy acted upon this plan. Many men in his place, no doubt, would have steered the conversation skillfully to the subject of the Eighth Commandment, and then said, Talking about stealing, did I ever tell you that I was a burglar myself for about six years? Jimmy was reticent. All that was over, he told himself. He had given it up. He had buried the past. Why exhume it? It did not occur to him to confess his New York crimes to Molly any more than to tell her that, when seven, he had been caned for stealing jam. These things had happened to a man of the name of Jimmy Pitt. It was true. But it was not the Jimmy Pitt who had proposed to Molly in the canoe on the lake. The vapid and irreflective reader may jump to the conclusion that Jimmy was a casuist, and ought to have been ashamed of himself. He will be perfectly right. On the other hand, one excuse may urged in his favor. His casuistry imposed upon himself. To Jimmy, shaving, there entered, in the furtive manner habitual to that unreclaimed buccaneer, Spike Mullins. "'Say, Mr. James,' he said. "'Well,' said Jimmy, "'and how goes the world with the young Lord Fitz Mullins? "'Spike, have you ever been best man?' on your way what's that best man at a wedding chap who stands by the bridegroom with a hand on the scruff of his neck to see that he goes through with it fellow who looks after everything crowds the crisp banknotes into the clergyman after the ceremony and then goes off and marries the first bridesmaid and lives happily ever after i ain't got no use for getting married mr james spike the misogynist you wait spike some day love will awake in your heart, and you'll start writing poetry. I's not that kind of mug, Mr. James, protested Spike. There was a goyle, though. Only I was never her steady, and she married one of the otter boys. Why didn't you knock him down and carry her off? He was the lightweight champion of the world. That makes a difference, doesn't it? But away with melancholy, Spike. I'm feeling as if somebody had given me Broadway for a birthday present. Used to de good, agreed Spike. Well, any news? Keg's all right. How are you getting on? Mr. James, Spike sank his voice to a whisper. That's what I chased meself here about. There's a mug down in the Soivans Hall what's a detective. Yes, that's right, if I ever saw one. What makes you think so? On your way, Mr. James. Can't I tell? I could pick out a fly cop out of a bunch of a thousand. Sure. This mug's valley to Sir Thomas. That's him. But he ain't no valley. He's come to see that no one don't get busy with the jewels. Say, what do you think of them jewels, Mr. James? Finest I ever saw. Yes, that's right. The limit, ain't they? And you's really? No, Spike, I'm not. Thank you very much for inquiring. I'm never going to touch a jewel again unless I've paid for it and got the receipt in my pocket. Spike shuffled despondently. All the same, said Jimmy, I shouldn't give yourself away to this detective. If he tries pumping you at all, 
Give him the frozen face. Sure, but he ain't the only one. What? More detectives? They'll have to put up houseful boards at this rate. Who's the other? De mug that came this afternoon. Old man McEachern brought him. I seed Miss Molly talking to him. The chap from the inn? Why, that's an old New York friend of McEachern's. Anyhow, Mr. James, he's a sleut. I can tell em by their eyes, and their feet, and the whole of them. An idea came into Jimmy's mind. I see, he said. Our friend McEachern has got him in to spy on us. I might have known he'd be up to something like that. That's right, Mr. James. Of course, you may be mistaken. Not me, Mr. James. Anyhow, I shall be seeing him at dinner. I can get talking to him afterward. I shall soon find out what his game is. For the moment, Molly was forgotten. The old reckless spirit was carrying him away. This thing was a deliberate challenge. He had been on parole. He had imagined that his word was all that McEachern had to rely on. But if the policeman had been working secretly against him all this time, his parole was withdrawn automatically. The thought that, if he did nothing, McEachern would put it down complacently to the vigilance of his detective and his own astuteness in engaging him stung Jimmy. His six years of burglary had given him an odd sort of professional pride. "'I've a half a mind,' he said softly. The familiar expression on his face was not lost on Spike. "'To try for the jewels, Mr. James?' he asked eagerly. His words broke the spell. Molly resumed her place. The hard look died out of Jimmy's eyes. "'No,' he said. "'Not that. It can't be done.' "'Yes, it could, Mr. James. Dead easy. I've been up to the room and seen the box what the jewels is put in at night. We could get at them as easy as pulling the plug out of a bottle. Say, this is the softest proposition, this house. Look what I got this afternoon, Mr. James.' He plunged his hand into his pocket and drew it out again. As he unclosed his fingers, Jimmy caught the gleam of precious stones. He started as one who sees snakes in the grass. "'What the?' he gasped. Spike was looking at his treasure trove with an air of affectionate proprietorship. "'Where on earth did you get those?' asked Jimmy. "'Out of one of the rooms. They belong to one of the Lloydies.' "'It was the easiest old thing ever, Mr. James. I went in when there was nobody about, and there they were on the table. I never butted into anything so soft, Mr. James. Spike. Yes, Mr. James. Do you remember the room you took them from? Sure. It was the foist, Auntie. Then just listen to me for a moment. When we're at dinner, you've got to go to that room and put those things back. All of them, mind you. Just where you found them. Do you understand? Spike's jaw had fallen. Put them back, Mr. James? he faltered. Every single one of them. Mr. James, said Spike plaintively. You'll bear it in mind? Directly dinner has begun. Every one of those things goes back where it belongs. See? Very well, Mr. James. The dejection in his voice would have moved the sternest to pity. Doom had enveloped Spike's spirit. The sunlight had gone out of his life. Chapter 14 Spenny Blunt, meanwhile, was not feeling happy. Out of his life, too, had the sunshine gone. His assets amounted to one pound seven and fourpence, and he owed twenty pounds. He had succeeded, after dinner, in borrowing five pounds from Jimmy, who was in the mood when he would have lent five pounds to anybody who asked for it. But beyond that he had had no success in the course of a borrowing tour among the inmates of the Abbey. In the seclusion of his bedroom he sat down to smoke a last cigarette and think the thing over in all its aspects. He could see no way out of his difficulties. The thought had something of the dull persistency of a toothache. It refused to leave him. If only this had happened at Oxford, he knew of twenty kindly men who would have rallied round him and placed portions of their father's money at his disposal. But this was July. 
he would not see Oxford again for months. And, in the meantime, Wesson would be pressing for his money. Oh, damn, he said. He had come to this conclusion for the fiftieth time, when the door opened, and his creditor appeared in person. To Spenny, he looked like the embodiment of fate, a sort of male nemesis. I want to have a talk with you, Spenny, said Wesson, closing the door. Well? Wesson lit a cigarette and threw the match out of the window before replying. Look here, Spenny, he said. I want to marry Miss McEachern. Spenny was in no mood to listen to the love affairs of other men. Oh, he said. Yes, and I want you to help me. Help you? You must have a certain amount of influence with her. She's your sister. Stepsister. Same thing. Well, anyhow, it's no good coming to me. Nobody's likely to make Molly do a thing unless she wants to. I couldn't if I tried for a year. We're good pals and all that, but she'd shut me up like a knife if I went to her and said I wanted her to marry someone. Not being a perfect fool, said Wesson impatiently, I don't suggest that you should do that. What's the idea, then? You can easily talk about me to her, praise me, and so on. Spenny's eyes opened wide. Praise you? How? Thanks, said Wesson, with a laugh. If you can't think of any admirable qualities in me, you'd better invent some. I should feel such a silly ass. That would be a new experience for you, wouldn't it? And then you can arrange it so that I shall get chances of talking to her. You can bring us together. Spenny's eyes became rounder. You seem to have mapped out quite a program for me. She'll listen to you. You can help me a lot. Can I? Wesson threw away his cigarette. And there's another thing, he said. You can queer that fellow Pitt's game. She's always with him now. You must get her away from him. Run him down to her, and get him out of this place as soon as possible. You invited him here. He doesn't expect to stop here indefinitely, I suppose. If you left, he'd have to, too. What you must do is go back to London directly after the theatricals are over. He'll have to go with you. Then you can drop him in London and come back. It is improbable that Wesson was blind to certain blemishes which could have been urged against this ingenious scheme by a critic with a nice sense of the honorable. But in his general conduct of life, as in his play at cards, he was accustomed to ignore the rules when he felt disposed to do so. He proceeded to mention in detail a few of the things which he proposed to call upon his ally to do. A delicate pink flush might have been seen to spread over Spenny's face. He began to look like an angry rabbit. He had not a great deal of pride in his composition, but the thought of the ignominious role which Wesson was sketching out for him stirred what he had to its shallow depths. Talking on, Wesson managed with his final words to add the last straw. Of course, he said, that money you lost to me at Piquet. What was it? Ten? Twenty? Twenty pounds, wasn't it? Well, we could look on it as cancelled, of course. That will be all right. Spenny exploded. Will it? he cried, pink to the ears. Will it, by George? I'll pay you every frightful penny of it before the end of the week. What do you take me for? I should like to know. A fool if you refuse my offer. I've a fearfully good mind to give you a most frightful kicking. I shouldn't try, Spenny, if I were you. It's not the form of indoor game at which you'd shine. Better stick to piquet. If you think I can't pay you your rotten money. I do, but if you can, so much the better. Money is always useful. I may be a fool in some ways. You understate it, my dear Spenny. But I'm not a cad. You're getting quite rosy, Spenny. Wrath is good for the complexion. And if you think you can bribe me to do your dirty work, you never made a bigger mistake in your life. Yes, I did, said Wesson, when I thought you had some glimmerings of intelligence. But if it gives you any pleasure to behave like the juvenile lead in a melodrama, by all means do. 
Personally, I shouldn't have thought the game would be worth a candle. Your keen sense of honor, I understand you to say, will force you to pay your debt. It's an expensive luxury nowadays, Spenny. You mentioned the end of the week, I believe. That will suit me admirably. But if you change your mind, my offer is still open. Good night, Galahad. Chapter 15 for pure discomfort there are few things in the world that can compete with the final rehearsals of an amateur theatrical performance at a country house. Every day the atmosphere becomes more and more heavily charged with restlessness and irritability. The producer of the piece, especially if he is also the author of it, develops a sort of intermittent insanity. He plucks at his mustache, if he has one, at his hair, if he has not. He mutters to himself. He gives vent to occasional despairing cries. The soothing suavity which marks his demeanor in the earlier rehearsals disappears. He no longer says with a winning smile, Splendid, old man, splendid. Couldn't be better. But I think we'll take that over just once more, if you don't mind. You missed out a few rather good lines, and you forgot to give Miss Robinson her cue for upsetting the flower pot. Instead, he rolls his eyes and snaps out. Once more, please, this will never do. At this rate, we might just as well cut out the show altogether. For heaven's sakes, Brown, do try and remember your lines. It's no good having the best part in the piece if you go and forget everything you've got to say. What's that? All right on the night? No, it won't be all right on the night. And another thing, you must remember to say... How calm and peaceful the morning is! Or how on earth do you think Miss Robinson is going to know when to upset that flower-pot? Now then, once more, and do pull yourself together this time. After which the scene is sulkily resumed by the now thoroughly irritated actors. And conversation, when the parties concerned meet subsequently, is cold and strained. Matters had reached this stage at the Abbey. Everybody was thoroughly tired of the piece, and, but for the thought of the disappointment which, presumably, would rack the neighboring nobility and gentry if it were not to be produced, would have resigned without a twinge of regret. People who had schemed to get the best and longest parts were wishing now that they had been content with the first footman or Giles, a villager. I'll never run an amateur show again as long as I live, confided Charteris to Jimmy, almost tearfully the night before the production. It's not good enough. Most of them aren't word-perfect yet, and we've just had the dress rehearsal. It'll be all right on. Oh, don't say it'll be all right on the night. I wasn't going to, said Jimmy. I was going to say it will be all right after the night. People will soon forget how badly the thing went. You're a nice, comforting sort of man, aren't you? said Charteris. Why worry, said Jimmy. If you go on like this, it will be Westminster Abbey for you're in your prime. You'll be getting brain fever. Jimmy himself was feeling particularly cheerful. He was deriving a keen amusement at present from the maneuvers of Mr. Samuel Gaylor of New York. This lynx-eyed man, having been instructed by Mr. McEachern to watch Jimmy, was doing so with a pertinacity which would have made a man with the snowiest of consciousness suspicious. If Jimmy went to the billiard room after dinner, Mr. Gaylor was there to keep him company. If during the course of the day he had occasion to fetch a handkerchief or a cigarette case from his bedroom, he was sure, on emerging, to stumble upon Mr. Gaylor in the corridor. The employees of Riggs Detective Agency Limited believed in earning their salaries. Occasionally, after these encounters, Jimmy would come upon Sir Thomas Blunt's valet, the other man in whom Spike's trained eye had discerned the distinguishing trait of the detective. He was usually somewhere around the corner at these moments, and when collided with, apologized with great politeness. It tickled Jimmy to think that both these giant brains should be so greatly exercised on his account. Spenny, meanwhile, had been doing quite an unprecedented amount of thinking. 
quite an intellectual pallor had begun to appear on his normally pink cheeks he had discovered the profound truth that it is one thing to talk about paying one's debts another actually to do it and that this is more particularly the case when we owe twenty pounds and possess but six pounds seven shillings and four pence spinney was acutely conscious of the fact that if he could not follow up his words to wesson with actual coin the result would be something of an anticlimax somehow or other he would have to get the money and at once the difficulty was that no one seemed at all inclined to lend it to him there is a good deal to be said against stealing as a habit but it cannot be denied that in certain circumstances it offers an admirable solution of a difficulty and if the penalties were not so exceedingly unpleasant it is probable that it would become far more fashionable than it is spenny's mind did not turn immediately to this outlet from his embarrassment he had never stolen before and it did not occur to him directly to do so now there is a conservative strain in all of us but gradually as it was borne in upon him that it was the only course possible unless he applied to his stepfather a task for which his courage was not sufficient he found himself contemplating the possibility of having to secure the money by unlawful means by lunch time on the morning of the day fixed for the theatricals he had decided definitely to do so by dinner time he had fixed upon the object of his attentions with a vague idea of keeping the thing in the family he had resolved to make his raid upon sir thomas blunt somehow it did not seem so bad robbing one's relatives a man's first crime is as a rule a shockingly amateurish affair now and then it is true we find beginners forging with the accuracy of old hands or breaking into houses with the finish of experts but these are isolated cases the average tyro lacks generalship altogether spenny may be cited as a typical novice it did not strike him that inquiries might be instituted by sir thomas when he found his money gone and that wesson finding a man whom he knew to be in pecunious suddenly in possession of twenty pounds might have suspicions his mind was entirely filled with the thought of getting the money there was no room in it for any other reflection his plan was simple sir thomas he knew always carried a good deal of money with him it was unlikely that he kept this on his person in the evening a man to whom the set of his clothes is as important as it was to sir thomas does not carry a pocket-book full of bank-notes when he is dressed for dinner he would leave it somewhere reasoned spenny where he asked himself the answer was easy in his dressing-room spenny's plan of campaign was complete the theatricals began at half-past eight the audience had been hustled into their seats happier than is usual in such circumstances from the rumor that the proceedings were to terminate with an informal dance the abbey was singularly well constructed for such a purpose there was plenty of room and a sufficiency of retreat for those who sat out in addition to a conservatory large enough to have married off half the couples in the county the audience was in an excellent humor and the monologue the first item of the program was received with a warmth which gave charteris whom rehearsals had turned into a pessimist a faint hope that the main item on the program might not be the complete failure it had promised to be spenny's idea had been to get through his burglarious specialty during the monologue when his absence would not be noticed it might be that if he disappeared later in the evening people would wonder what had become of him he lurked apart until the last of the audience had taken their seats as he was passing through the hall a hand fell on his shoulder conscience makes cowards of us all spenny bit his tongue and leaped three inches into the air hello charteris he said gaspingly spenny my boyhood's only friend said charteris where are you off to what what do you mean i was just going upstairs then don't you're wanted our prompter can't be found 
I want you to take his place till he blows in. Come along. The official prompter arrived at the end of the monologue with the remark that he had been having a bit of a smoke in the garden, and his watch had gone wrong. Leaving him to discuss the point with Charteris, Spenny slipped quietly away and flitted up the stairs toward Sir Thomas's dressing room. At the door he stopped and listened. There was no sound. The house might have been deserted. He opened the door and switched on the electric light. Fortune was with him. On the dressing table, together with a bunch of keys and some small change, lay a brown leather pocket book. Evidently, Sir Thomas did not share Lady Blunt's impression that the world was waiting for a chance to rob him as soon as his back was turned. Spenny opened the pocket book and counted the contents. There were two ten pound notes and four of five pounds. He took a specimen of each variety replaced the pocket-book, and crept out of the door. Then he walked rapidly down the corridor to his own room. Just as he reached it, he received a shock only less severe than the former one from the fact that this time no hand was placed on his shoulder. "'Spenny!' cried a voice. He turned to see Molly. She wore the costume of the stage milkmaid. Coming out of her room after dressing for her part, she had been in time to see Spenny emerge through Sir Thomas's door, with a look on his face furtive enough to have made any jury bring a verdict of guilty on any count without further evidence. She did not know what he had been doing, but she was very certain that it was something which he ought to have left undone. "'Er, hello, Molly,' said Spenny bonelessly. "'What were you doing in Uncle Thomas's room, Spenny?' "'Nothing. I was just looking round. Just looking round? That's all. Molly was puzzled. Why did you look like that when you came out? Like what? So guilty. Guilty? What are you talking about? Molly suddenly saw light. Spenny, she said, what were you putting in your pocket as you came out? Putting in my pocket, said Spenny, rallying with the desperation of one fighting a lost cause. What do you mean? You were putting something. Another denial was hovering on Spenny's lips, when in a flash he saw what he had not seen before, the cloud of suspicion which must hang over him when the loss of the notes was discovered. Sir Thomas would remember that he had tried to borrow money from him. Wesson would wonder how he had become possessed of twenty pounds. And Molly had actually seen him coming out of the room, putting something in his pocket. He threw himself at the mercy of the court. "'It's like this, Molly,' he said. And, having prefaced his narrative with the sound remark that he had been a fool, he gave her a summary of recent events. "'I see,' said Molly. "'And you must pay him at once?' "'By the end of the week. We had a bit of a row.' "'What about?' "'Oh, nothing,' said Spinney. "'Anyhow, I told him I'd pay him by Saturday.' and I don't want to have to climb down. Of course not. Jimmy shall lend you the money. Who? Jimmy Pitt? Yes. But I say, look here, Molly. I mean, I've been to him already. He lent me a fiver. He might kick if I tried to touch him again so soon. I'll ask him for it. But look here, Molly. Jimmy and I are engaged, Spenny. What? Not really. I say, I'm frightfully pleased. He's one of the best. I'm fearfully glad. Why, that's absolutely topping. It'll be all right. I'll sweat to pay him back. I'll save out of my allowance. I can easily do it if I cut out a few things and don't go about much. You're a frightfully good sort, Molly. I say, will you ask him tonight? I want to pay Wesson first thing tomorrow morning. Very well. You better give me those notes, Spinney. I'll put them back. The amateur cracksman handed over his loot and retired toward the stairs. Molly could hear him going down them three at a time, in a whirl of relief and good resolutions. She went to Sir Thomas's room and replaced the notes. 
having done this she could not resist the temptation to examine herself in the glass for a few moments then she turned away switched off the light and was just about to leave the room when a soft footstep in the passage outside came to her ears she shrank back she felt a curiously guilty sensation as if she had been in the room with a criminal rather than benevolent intentions her motives in being where she was were excellent but she would wait till this person had passed before coming out into the passage then it came to her with a shock that the person was not going to pass the footsteps halted outside the door there was a curtain at her side behind which hung certain suits of sir thomas's she stepped noiselessly behind this the footsteps passed on into the room chapter sixteen jimmy had gone up to his room to put on the costume he was to wear in the first act at about the time when spenny was being seized upon by charteris to act as prompter as he moved toward the stairs a square-cut figure appeared it was the faithful gaoler there was nothing in his appearance to betray the detective to the unskilled eye but years of practice had left spike with a sort of sixth sense as regarded the force he could pierce the subtlest disguise jimmy had this gift in an almost equal degree and it had not needed mr gaylor's constant shadowing of himself to prove to jimmy the correctness of spike's judgment he looked at the representative of Wragg's Detective Agency Limited as he stood before him now, taking in his every detail. The square, unintelligent face, the badly cut clothes, the clumsy heels, the enormous feet. And this, he said to himself, is the man McEachern thinks capable of tying my hands. There were moments when the spectacle of Mr. Gaylor filled Jimmy with an odd sort of fury, a kind of hurt professional pride. The feeling that this espionage was a direct challenge enraged him. Behind this clumsy watcher he saw always the satisfied figure of Mr. McEachern. He seemed to hear him chuckling to himself. If it wasn't for Molly, he said to himself, I'd teach McEachern a lesson. I'm trying to hold myself in, and he sets these fool detectives on to me. I shouldn't mind if he'd chosen somebody who knew the rudiments of the game, but Gaylor? Gaylor! Well, Mr. Gaylor, he said aloud, you aren't trying to escape, are you? You're coming in to see the show, aren't you? Oh, yes, said the detective. Just wanted to go upstairs for half a minute. You coming, too? I was going to dress, said Jimmy, as they went up. See you later, he added at the door. Hope you'll like the show. He went into his room. Mr. Gaylor passed on. Jimmy had finished dressing, and had picked up a book to occupy the ten minutes before he would be needed downstairs, when there burst into the room Spike Mullins, in a state of obvious excitement. "'Gee, Mr. James!' "'Hello, Spike.' Spike went to the door, opened it, and looked up and down the passage. "'Mr. James,' he said in a whisper, shutting the door. There's been doings tonight for fair. Me Coco's still buzzin. Say, I was to Sir Thomas's dressing room. What? What were you doing there? Spike looked somewhat embarrassed. He grinned apologetically and shuffled his feet. I've got them, Mr. James, he said. Got them? Got what? These. He plunged his hand in his pocket and drew forth a glittering mass. Jimmy's jaw dropped as he gazed at Lady Blunt's rope of pearls. Two hundred thousand plunks,' murmured Spike, gazing lovingly at them. "'I says to myself, Mr. James ain't got no time to be gettin' after them himself. He's too busy these days with jollying along the swells. So it's up to me, I says, cause Mr. James will be tickled to death. All right, all right, if we can get away with them. So I—' Jimmy gave tongue with an energy which amazed his faithful follower. "'Spike, you lunatic! Didn't I tell you there was nothing doing when you wanted to take those things the other day?' "'Sure, Mr. James. But those little dinky things. These poils is boys for fair.' "'Good heaven, Spike! You must be mad. Can't you see? Oh, Lord!' 
directly the loss of those pearls is discovered we shall have those detectives after us in a minute didn't you know they'd been watching us an involuntary chuckle escaped spike excuse me mr james but that's funny about dem sleuths listen dey's been and arrest each other what that's right they had a scrap in de dark each thinking de other was after de jewels and not knowing dey was both sleuths and now one of dem's been taken de other off and locked him in de cellar what on earth do you mean spike giggled at the recollection listen mr james it's this way i'm in de dressing room chasing round with this lantern here for de jewel box he produced from his other pocket a small bicycle lamp and just as i gets a line on it gee i hears footsteps coming down the passage straight for de door was to de bat that's right gee i says to meself here's one of de sleuths guys what's been a got wise to me and he's coming in to put de grip on me so i gets up and i blows out de lantern and i stands there in de dark waiting for him to come in and then i'm going to get busy before he can see who i am and jolt him one on de point and then while he's down and out chase myself for de solvents hall yes said jimmy well this guy he gets to de door and opens it and i'm just going to butt in when der suddenly jumps out from de room on de other side the passage another guy and gets de rapid stranglehold on dis foist mug say wouldn't that make you wonder was you on your feet or your cocoa go on what happened then they begins to scrap good and hard in de dark they couldn't see me and i couldn't see dem but i could hear them bumpin and a sluggin each other all right all right and by and by one of them puts the other to bad so that he goes down and takes the count and then i hears a click and i know what that is one of the guys has put the irons on the other guy then i hears him strike a light i turn the switch what lights up the passage before i got into the room then he says ah he says got yous have i not the boy i expected but you'll do i knew his voice it was dat mug what calls himself gaylor i suppose i'm the bird he expected said jimmy well the other mug was too busy catching up with his breath to shoot it back swift but after he's been doing de deep breathing stunt for a while he says you mutt he says you's do de bad you've made a break you have he put it different but that's what he meant then he says that he's a sleut too does de gaylor mug give him de glad eye not on your life he says that that's de voice tale that's ever been handed to him de other mug says i'm sir tumas valley he says ah cut it out says gaylor sure you ain't sir tumas himself show me to him says de voice guy then you'll see not on your life says gaylor what but in among de swells what's enjoying themselves and spoil their evening by showing them a face like yours to de woods it's used for de coal cellar me man and we'll see what you's got to say afterward go on and off they went and i let me lantern again got de jewels and chased myself here jimmy stretched out his hand all very exciting he said and now you'll just hand me those pearls and i'll seize the opportunity while the coast is clear to put them back where they belong only for a moment did spike hesitate then he pulled out the jewels and placed them in jimmy's hand mr james was mr james and what he said went but his demeanor was tragic telling eloquently of hopes blighted jimmy took the necklace with a thrill he was an expert in jewels and a fine gem affected him much as a fine picture affects the artistic he went to the light and inspected them gloatingly as he did so he uttered a surprised exclamation he ran the jewels through his fingers he scrutinized them again more closely this time then he turned to spike with a curious smile you'd better be going downstairs he said i'll just run along and replace them where's the box it's on de floor against de wall near de window mr james 
Good. Better give me that lamp. There was no one in the passage. He raced softly along it to Sir Thomas Blunt's dressing room. He lit his lamp and found the box without difficulty. Dropping the necklace in, he closed down the lid. They'll want a new lock, I'm afraid, he said. However, he rose to his feet. Jimmy, said a startled voice. He whipped around. The light of the lamp fell on Molly, standing pale and open-eyed, beside the curtain by the door. Chapter 17 Pressed, rigid against the wall behind her curtain, Molly had listened in utter bewilderment to the sounds of strife in the passage outside. The half-heard conversation between the detectives had done nothing toward a solution of the mystery. Gaylor's voice she thought she recognized as one that she had heard before, but she could not identify it. When the detectives had passed away together down the corridor, she had imagined that the adventure was at an end and that she was at liberty to emerge, cautiously, from her hiding place and follow them downstairs. She had stretched out a hand to draw the curtain aside, when she caught sight of the yellow ray of the lamp on the floor and shrank back again. As she did so, she heard the sound of breathing. Somebody was still in the room. Her mystification deepened. She had supposed that the tale of visitors to the dressing room was complete with the two who had striven in the passage. Yet there was another. She strained her ears to catch a sound. For a while she heard nothing. Then came a voice that she knew well and abandoning concealment she came out into the room and found jimmy kneeling on the floor beside the rifled jewel box for a full minute they stood staring at each other without a word the light of the lamp hurt molly's eyes she put up a hand to shade them the silence was oppressive it seemed to molly that they had been standing like this for years jimmy had not moved there was something in his attitude which filled Molly with a vague fear. In the shadow behind the lamp, he looked shapeless and inhuman. "'What are you doing here?' he said at last, in a harsh, unnatural voice. "'I—' she stopped. "'You're hurting my eyes,' she said. "'I'm sorry. I didn't think. Is that better?' He turned the light from her face. Something in his voice and the apologetic haste with which he moved the lamp seemed to relax the strain of the situation. The feeling of stunned surprise began to leave her. She found herself thinking coherently again. The relief was but momentary. Why was Jimmy in the room at that time? Why had he a lamp? What had he been doing? The question shot from her brain like sparks from an anvil. The darkness began to tear at her nerves. She felt along the wall for the switch, and flooded the room with light. Jimmy laid down the lantern, and stood for a moment undecided. He looked at Molly, and suddenly there came over him an overwhelming desire to tell her everything. He had tried to stifle his conscience, to assure himself that the old days were over, and that there was no need to refer to them and for a while he had imposed upon himself. But lately the falseness of his position had come home to him. He could not allow her to marry him, in ignorance of what he had been. It would be a villainous thing to do. Often he had tried to tell her, but had failed. He saw that it must be done, here and now. He lifted the lid of the jewel box, and dangled the necklace before her eyes. She drew back. Jimmy, you were stealing them? No, I was putting them back. Putting them back? Listen, I'm going to tell you the truth, Molly. I've been trying to for days, but I never had the pluck. I wasn't stealing this necklace, but for seven years I've lived by this sort of thing. By, by stealing, by breaking into houses and stealing. There. It isn't nice, is it? But it's the truth. And whatever happens, I'm glad you know. Stealing, said Molly slowly. You! He took a step forward and laid his hand on her arm. She shrank away from him. His hand fell to his side like lead. 
Molly, do you hate me? How could you? she whispered. How could you? Molly, I want to tell you a story. Are you listening? It's the story of a weak devil who was put up to fight the world, and wasn't strong enough for it. He got a bad start, and he never made it up. They sent him to school, the best school in the country, and he got expelled. Then they gave him a hundred pounds, and told him to make out for himself. He was seventeen then. Seventeen, mind you. And all he knew was a little Latin and Greek, a very little, and nothing else. And they sent him out to make his fortune. He stopped. It will be much simpler to tell it in the first person, he said, with a short laugh. I arrived in New York. I was seventeen, you will remember, with ninety pounds in my pocket. It seemed illimitable wealth at the time. Two pounds was the most I had ever possessed before. I could not imagine its ever coming to an end. In dollars it seemed an inconceivable amount of money. I put up at the Waldorf. I remember I took a cab there. I gave the man three dollars. He laughed again. You can guess how long my ninety pounds lasted. Within a month I had begun to realize that my purse was shallower than I had thought. It occurred to me that work of some sort would be an advantage. I went round and tried to get some. My God, I remember, I was seventeen, and absolutely ignorant of every useful trade under the sun. Go on. One day I was lunching at the Quinton when a man came and sat down at the same table, and we got into a conversation. I had spent the morning answering want advertisements, and I was going to break my last twenty-dollar bill to pay for my lunch. I was in the frame of mind when I would have done anything, good or bad, that would have given me some money. The man was very friendly. After lunch he took me off to his rooms. He had a couple of parlor rooms on 45th Street. Then he showed his hand. He was a pretty scoundrel, but I didn't care. I didn't care for anything, except that there seemed to be money to be had from him. Honesty. Put a man in New York with nineteen dollars and a few cents in his pockets, and no friends, and see what happens. It's a hell for the poor in New York. An iron, grinding city. It frightens you. It's so big and hard and cruel. It takes the fight out of you. I've felt it, and I know. He stopped and gave a little shiver. Nine years had passed since that day, but a man who has all but gone under in a big city does not readily forget the nightmare horror of it. Stone, that was the man's name, was running a tapless wiretapping game. You've read about the trick, I expect. Everyone has known about it since Larry Summerfield was sent to Sing Sing. But it was new then. There are lots of ways of doing it. Stones was to hire a room and fix it up to look like a branch of the Western Union Telegraph Company. He would bring men in there and introduce them to a man he called the manager of the branch, who was supposed to get racing results ten minutes before they were sent out to the pool rooms. The victim would put up the money for a bet and Stone and his friends got it at once. Stone was looking for an assistant. He wanted a man who looked like a gentleman, to inspire confidence. I looked older than I was, and he took me on. It was a filthy business, but I was in a panic. I was with Stone eight months. Then I left him. It was too unsavory, even for me. It was after that that I became a cracksman, I wanted money. It was no use hoping for work. I couldn't get it, and I couldn't have done it if I had got it. I was a pirate, and fit for nothing except piracy. One night I met a man in a Broadway Rathskeller. I knew him by sight. I had seen him about at places. "'You're with Stone, aren't you?' he said, after we had talked about racing and other things for a while. I stared at him in surprise. I was frightened, too. It's all right, he said. I know all about Stone. You needn't be afraid of me. Aren't you with him? 
I was, I said. You left him? Why? I told him. You seem a bright kid, he said. Join me if you feel like it. He was a cracksman. I never found out his real name. He was always called Bob. A curious man. He had been at Harvard and spoke half a dozen languages. I think he took to burglary from sheer craving for excitement. He used to speak of it as if it were an art. I joined him, and he taught me all he knew. When he died, he was run over by a car. I went on with the thing. Then my uncle died, and I came back to England rich. When I left the lawyer's office, I made up my mind that I would draw a line across my life. I swore I would never crack another crib. And when I met you, I swore it again. And yet? No, it isn't as bad as you think. When I was in London, I fell in with a man named Mullins, who used to work with me in the old days. He was starving, so I took him in, and brought him along here with me, to keep him out of mischief. Tonight he came to me with this necklace. He had been in here and stolen it. I took it from him and came to put it back. You believe me, don't you, Molly? Yes, she said simply. He came a step nearer. Molly, don't give me up. I know I've been a blackguard, but I swear that's all over now. I've drawn a line right through it. I oughtn't to have let myself love you. But I couldn't help it. I couldn't, dear. You won't give me up, will you? If you'd only take me in hand, you could make what you liked of me. I'd do anything for you. Any mortal thing you wanted. You can make me just anything you please. Will you try? Molly. He stopped. She held out both her hands to him. The next moment she had gone. Chapter 18 With a wonderful feeling of light-heartedness, Jimmy turned once more to the jewel box. He picked up the lamp and switched off the electric light. He had dropped the necklace to the floor, and had knelt to recover it when the opening of the door, followed by a blaze of light and a startled exclamation, brought him to his feet with a bound, blinking but alert. In the doorway stood Sir Thomas Blunt. His face expressed the most lively astonishment. His bulging eyes were fixed upon the pearls in Jimmy's hand. "'Good evening,' said Jimmy pleasantly. Sir Thomas stammered. It is a disquieting experience to find the floor of one's dressing-room occupied by a burglar. "'What? What? What?' said Sir Thomas. "'Out with it,' said Jimmy. "'What?' "'I knew a man once who stammered,' said Jimmy. He used to chew dog-biscuit while he was speaking. It cured him, besides being nutritious. "'You—you you blackguard,' said Sir Thomas. Jimmy placed the pearls carefully on the dressing-table. Then he turned to Sir Thomas, with his hands in the pockets of his coat. It was a tight corner, but he had been in tighter in his time, and in this instance he fancied that he held a winning card. He found himself enjoying the interview. So, so it's you, is it? said Sir Thomas. Who told you? So you're a thief, went on the baronet viciously, a low thief. Dash it all, I say. Come now, protested Jimmy. Not low. You may not know me over here, but I've got a big American reputation. Ask anybody, but... And I say, added Jimmy, I know you don't mean to be offensive, but I wish you wouldn't call me a thief. I'm a cracksman. There's a world of difference between the two branches of the profession. I mean, well, suppose you were an actor-manager. You wouldn't like to be called a super, would you? I mean, well, you see, don't you? An ordinary thief, for instance, would use violence in a case like this. Violence except in extreme cases. I hope this won't be one of them, is contrary to cracksman etiquette. On the other hand, Sir Thomas, I should like to say that I have you covered. There was a pipe in the pocket of his coat. He thrust the stem of this earnestly against the lining. Sir Thomas eyed the protuberance apprehensively, and turned a little pale. 
My gun, as you see, is in my pocket. It is loaded and cocked. It is pointing straight at you at the present moment, and my finger is on the trigger. I may add that I'm a dead shot at a yard and a half, so I should recommend you not to touch that bell you're looking at. Sir Thomas's hand wavered. Do, if you like, of course, said Jimmy agreeably. In any case, I shan't fire to kill you. I shall just smash your knees. Beastly painful, but not fatal. He waggled the pipe suggestively. Sir Thomas blanched. His hand fell to his side. How are the theatricals going? asked Jimmy. Did you like the monologue? Sir Thomas had backed away from the bell, but the retreat was merely for the convenience of the moment. He understood that it might be inconvenient to press the button just then, but he had recovered his composure by this time, and he saw that the game must be his. Jimmy was trapped, and he hastened to make this clear to him. How, may I ask, he said, do you propose to leave the Abbey? I suppose they'll let me have the automobile, said Jimmy. They can hardly ask me to walk, but I wasn't thinking of leaving just yet. You mean to stop? Why not? It's a pretty place. And what steps, if I may ask, do you imagine I shall take? Waltz steps. They're going to have a dance after the show, you know. You ought to be in that. You wish me, in fact, to become a silent accomplice, to refrain from mentioning this little matter? You put things so well. And do you propose to keep my wife's jewels, or may I have them? Oh, you may have those, said Jimmy. Thank you. I never touch paste. Sir Thomas failed to see the significance of this remark. Jimmy repeated it with emphasis. I never touch paste, he said, and Lady Blunt's necklace is, I regret to say, made of that material. Sir Thomas grew purple. Mind you, said Jimmy, it's very good paste. I'll say that for it. I didn't see through it till I had it in my hands. Looking at the thing, even quite close, I was taken in for a moment. The baronet made strange, gurgling noises. Paste, he said, speaking with difficulty. Paste, paste. Damn your impertinence, sir. Are you aware that that necklace cost forty thousand pounds? then whoever paid that sum for it wasted a great deal of money. Paste it is, and paste it always will be. It can't be paste. How do you know? How do I know? I'm an expert. Ask a jeweler how he knows diamonds from paste. He can feel them. He can almost smell them. Let me look. It's impossible. Certainly. I don't know the extent of your knowledge of pearls. If it is even moderate... I think you will admit that I am right. Sir Thomas snatched the necklace from the table and darted with it to the electric light. He scrutinized it, breathing heavily. Jimmy's prophecy was fulfilled. The baronet burst into a vehement flood of oaths and hurled the glittering mass across the room. The unemotional mask of the man seemed to have been torn off him. He shook with futile passion. Jimmy watched him in interested silence. Sir Thomas ran to the jewels and would have crushed them beneath his feet had not Jimmy sprang forward and jerked him away from them. Be quiet, he said. Confound you, sir. Will you stop that noise? Sir Thomas, unaccustomed to this style of address, checked the flood for a moment. Now, said Jimmy, you see the situation. At present, you and I are the only persons alive to the best of our knowledge, who know about this. Stay, though, there must be one other. The real necklace must have been stolen. It is impossible to say when. Years ago, perhaps. Well, that doesn't affect us. The thief, whoever he is, is not likely to reveal what he knows. So here you have it in a nutshell. Let me go and don't say a word about having found me here and I will do the same for you. No one will know that the necklace is not genuine. I shall not mention the subject, and I imagine that you will not. Very well, then. Now for the alternative. Give me up, give the alarm, 
and I get, well, whatever they give me. I don't know what it would be, exactly. Something unpleasant. But what do you get out of it? Lady Blunt, if I may say so, is not precisely the sort of lady, I should think, who would bear loss like this calmly. If I know her, she will shout loudly for another necklace, and see that she gets it. I should fancy you would find the expense unpleasantly heavy. That is only one disadvantage of the alternative. Others will suggest themselves to you. Which is it to be? Sir Thomas suspended his operation of glaring at the paste necklace to glare at Jimmy. Well, said Jimmy, I should like your decision as soon as it's convenient to you. They will be wanting me on stage in a few minutes. Which is it to be? Which? snapped Sir Thomas. Why, go away and go to the devil. All in good time, said Jimmy cheerfully. I think you have chosen wisely. Coming downstairs? Sir Thomas made no response. He was regarding the necklace moodily. You'd better come. You'll enjoy the show. Charteris says it's the best piece there's been since the magistrate. And he ought to know. He wrote it. Well, good-bye, then. See you downstairs later, I suppose. For some time after he had gone, Sir Thomas stood motionless. Then he went across the room and picked up the necklace. It occurred to him that if Lady Blunt found it lying in a corner, there would be questions. And questions from Lady Blunt ranked among the keenest of his trials. If I had gone into the army, said Jimmy complacently to himself as he went downstairs, I should have been a great general. Instead of which I go about the country, scoring off dyspeptic baronets. Well, well. Chapter 19 the evening's entertainment was over. The last of the nobility and gentry had departed, and Mr. McEachern had retired to his lair to smoke, in his shirt-sleeves, the last and best cigar of the day, when his solitude was invaded by his old New York friend, Mr. Samuel Gaylor. "'I've done a fair cop, sir,' said Mr. Gaylor, without preamble, quivering with self-congratulation. "'How's that?' said the master of the house. A fair cop, sir. Caught him in the very blooming act, sir. Dark it was. Ooh, pitch. Fair pitch. Like this, sir. Room opposite where the jewels was. One of the gents' bedrooms. Me hiding in there. Door on the jar. Waited a goodish bit. Footsteps. Hello? They've stopped. Open door a trifle and looked out. Couldn't see much just made out a man's figure. Door of dressing room was open. Showed up against opening. Just see him. Caught you at it, my beauty, have I? Says I to myself. Out I jumped. Got hold of him. Being a bit to the good in strength, and knowing something about the game, downed him after a while and got the darbies on him. Took him off and locked him in the cellar. That's how it was, sir. "'Good boy,' said Mr. McEachern approvingly. "'You're no rube.' "'No, sir. Put one of these cigars into your face.' "'Thank you, sir. Very enjoyable thing, a cigar, sir. Especially a good un. I have a light. Thank you, sir.' "'Well, and who was he?' "'Not the man you told me to watch for. Another chap altogether. That red-headed—' "'No, sir.' dark-haired chap. Seen him hanging about, suspicious, for a long time. Had my eye on him. Mr. Gaylor chuckled reminiscently. Rummest card, sir. I ever lagged in my natural, he said. How's that? inquired Mr. McEachern amiably. Why, grinned Mr. Gaylor, you'll hardly believe it, sir, but he had the impudence, the gall, if I may use the word, the sauce to tell me he was in my own line of business. A detective, sir. He said he was going into the room to keep guard. I said to him at the time, I said, it's too thin, cocky. That's to say. Mr. McEachern started. A detective? A detective, sir, said Mr. Gaylor with a chuckle. I said to him at the time. The valet, cried Mr. McEachern. 
"'That's it, sir. Sir Thomas Blunt's valet he was. That's how he got into the house, sir.' Mr. McEachern grunted despairingly. "'The man was right. He is a detective. Sir Thomas brought him down from London. He never travels without him. You've done it. You've arrested one of the boys.' Mr. Gaylor's jaw dropped slightly. "'He was? He really was? You'd better go straight to where it was ye locked him up, and let him loose. And I'd suggest ye hand him an apology. Go on, mister. Lively as you can step.' "'I never thought—' "'That's a trouble with you fly-cops,' said his employer caustically. "'Ye never do think.' "'It never occurred to me.' "'Go on,' said the master of the house. "'Up an alley.' Mr. Gaylor departed. "'And then I asked them,' said Mr. McEachern, "'I asked them particularly not to send me a rube.' He lit another cigar, and began to brood over the folly of mankind. He was in a very pessimistic frame of mind when Jimmy curveted into the room, with his head in the clouds and his feet on air. "'Can you spare me a few minutes, Mr. McEachern?' said Jimmy. The policeman stared heavily. "'I can,' he said slowly. "'What is it?' "'Several things,' said Jimmy, sitting down. "'I'll take them in order. "'I'll start with our bright friend, Gaylor. "'Gaylor! "'Of New York, according to you. "'Personally, I should think that he's seen about as much of New York "'as I have of Timbuktu. "'Look here, McEachern. "'We've known each other some time, "'and I ask you, as man to man,' Do you think it plain the game to set a farmer like poor old Gaylor to watch me? I put it to you. The policeman stammered. The question chimed in so exactly with the opinion he had just formed, on his own account, of the human bloodhound who was now in the cellar making the peace with his injured fellow worker. Hit you where you live, that, doesn't it? said Jimmy. I wonder you didn't have more self-respect let alone consideration for my feelings. I'm surprised at you. You're... In fact, if you weren't going to be my father-in-law, I doubt if I could bring myself to forgive you. As it is, I overlook it. The policeman's face turned purple. Only, said Jimmy, with a quiet severity, taking a cigar from the box and snipping off the end. Don't let it occur again. He lit the cigar, Mr. McEachern continued to stare fixedly at him. So might the colonel of a regiment have looked at the latest joined subaltern, if the latter, during mess, had offered to teach him how to conduct himself on parade. "'I'm going to marry your daughter,' said Jimmy. "'You're going to marry me, daughter?' echoed Mr. McEachern, as one in a trance. "'I'm going to marry your daughter.' The purple deepened on McEachern's face. More, said Jimmy, blowing a smoke ring. She is going to marry me. We are going to marry each other, he explained. McEachern's glare became frightful. He struggled for speech. I must congratulate you, said Jimmy, on the way things went off tonight. It was a thorough success. Everybody was saying so. You're the most popular man in the county. What would they say of you at Jefferson Market if they knew? By the way, do you correspond with any of the old set? Splendid fellows they were. I wish we had some of them here tonight. Mr. McEachern's emotions found relief in words. He rose and waved a huge fist in Jimmy's face. His great body was shaking with rage. You! shouted the policeman. You! The fist was within an inch of Jimmy's chin. Outwardly calm, inwardly very much alive to the fact that at any moment the primitive man in him might lead his prospective father-in-law beyond the confines of self-restraint, Jimmy sat still in his chair, his eyes fixed steadily on those of his relative-to-be. It was an uncomfortable moment. Mr. McEachern if he made an assault, might regret it subsequently. But he would not be the first to do so. The man who did that would be a certain James Pitt. If it came to blows, 
the younger man could not hope to hold his own with the huge policeman. "'You!' roared McEachern. Jimmy fancied he could feel the wind of moving fist. "'You marry me, daughter! A New York crook! The sweepings of the Bowery! A man who ought to be in jail! I'd like to break your face in!' "'I noticed that,' said Jimmy. "'If it's all the same to you, will you take your fist out of my mouth?' It makes it a little difficult to carry on a conversation. And I've several things I should like to say. You'll listen to me. Certainly, you were saying. Ye come here, ye worm yourself into my house, crawl into it. I came by invitation, and in passing, not on all fours. Mr. McEacher, may I ask one question? What is it? If you don't want me, why did you let me stop here? The policeman stopped as if he had received a blow. There came flooding back into his mind the recollection of his position. In his wrath he had forgotten that Jimmy knew his secret, and he looked on Jimmy as a man who would use his knowledge. He sat down heavily. Jimmy went on smoking in silence for a while. He saw what was passing in his adversary's mind and it seemed to him that it would do no harm to let the thing sink in. "'Look here, Mr. McEachern,' he said at last. "'I wish you would listen quietly to me for a minute or two. There's really no reason on earth why we should always be at one another's throats in this way. We might just as well be friends, as we should be if we met now for the first time. Our difficulty is that we know too much about each other.' You knew me in New York, and you know what I did there. Naturally, you don't like the idea of my marrying your daughter. You can't believe that I'm not simply an ordinary yeg, like the rest of the crooks you used to know. I promise you, I'm not. Can't you see that it doesn't matter what a man has been? It's what he is and what he means to be that counts. Mr. Patrick McEachern, of Corvin Abbey, isn't the same as Constable McEachern, of the New York Police. Well, then, I have nothing to do with the man I was when you knew me first. I have disowned him. He is a back number. I am an ordinary English gentleman now. My uncle has left me more than well off. I am a baronet, and it is likely that a baronet, with money, mind you, is going to carry on the yeg business as a sideline? Be reasonable. There's really no possible objection to me now. Let's shake and call the fight off. Does that go? The policeman was plainly not unmoved by these arguments. He drummed his fingers on the table and stared thoughtfully at Jimmy. Is Molly? he said at length. Does Molly? Yes, said Jimmy and I can promise you I love her. Come along now. Why wait? McEachern looked doubtfully at Jimmy's outstretched hand. He moved his own an inch from the table, then let it fall again. Come on, said Jimmy. Do it now. Be a sport. And with a great grunt, which might have meant anything, from resignation to cordiality, Mr. McEachern capitulated. Chapter 20 the American liner, St. Louis, lay in the Empress Dock at Southampton, taking aboard her passengers. All sorts and conditions of men flowed in in an unceasing stream up the gangway. Leaning over the second-class railing, Jimmy Pitt and Spike Mullins watched them thoughtfully. Jimmy looked up at the blue peter that fluttered from the foremast, and then at Spike. The Bowery boy's face was stolid and expressionless. He was smoking a short wooden pipe, with an air of detachment. "'Well, Spike,' said Jimmy, "'your schooner's on the tide now, isn't it? Your vessel's at the quay. You've got some queer-looking fellow travelers. Don't miss the two Singalese sports, and the man in the turban and the baggy breeches. I wonder if they're airtight. Useful if he fell overboard.' Sure, said Spike, directing a contemplative eye toward the garment in question. He knows his business. I wonder what those men on the deck are writing. They've been scribbling away ever since we came here. Probably society journalists. 
we shall see in next week's sphere among the second-class passengers we noticed mr spike mullins looking as cheery as ever it's a pity you're so set on going spike why not change your mind and stop for a moment spike looked wistful then his countenance resumed its woodiness there ain't no use for me on this side mr james he said new york's de spot you don't want none of me now now you're married how's miss molly mr james splendid spike thanks we are going over to france by tonight's boat it's been a queer business said jimmy after a pause a deuced rum business well i've come very well out of it at any rate it seems to me that you're the only one of us who doesn't end happily spike i'm married mckeechern's butted into society so deep that it would take an excavating party with dynamite to get him out of it molly well molly's made a bad bargain but i hope she won't regret it we're all going some except you you're going out on the old trail again which begins in third avenue and ends in sing sing why tear yourself away spike spike concentrated his gaze on a weedy young immigrant in a blue jersey who was having his eye examined by the overworked doctor and seemed to be resenting it there's nothing doing on this side mr james he said at length i want to get busy ulysses mullins said jimmy looking at him curiously i know the feeling there's only one cure and i don't suppose you'll ever take it you don't think a lot of women do you you're the rugged bachelor goyles began spike comprehensively and abandoned the topic without dilating on it further jimmy lit his pipe and threw the match overboard the sun came out from behind a cloud and the water sparkled those were great jewels mr james said spike thoughtfully i believe you're still brooding over them spike we could have got away with them if you'd have stood for it dead easy you are brooding over them spike i'll tell you something which will console you a little before you start out on your wanderings that necklace was paste what's that nothing but paste they weren't worth thirty dollars a light of understanding came into spike's eyes his face beamed with the smile of one to whom dark matters are made clearer so that's why you wouldn't stand for getting away with them he exclaimed the last voyager had embarked the deck was full to congestion they'll be sending us ashore in a minute said jimmy i'd better be moving let me know how you're making out spike from time to time you know the address and i say it's just possible you may find you want a dollar or two every now and then when you're going to buy another automobile for instance well you know where to write for it don't you thanks mr james but that'll be all right i'm going to sit in at another game this time politics mr james a friend of a mug what i knows has got a pull me brother dan is an alderman with a grip on the levant ward he went on softly he'll find me a job you'll be a boss before you know where you are sure said spike grinning modestly you ought to be a thundering success in american politics said jimmy you've got all the necessary qualities a steward passed any more for the shore which shore asked jimmy well spike good-bye mr james good-bye said jimmy and good luck two tugs attached themselves excitedly to the liner's side the great ship began to move slowly from the shore jimmy stood at the water side and watched her the rails were lined with gesticulating figures in the front row spike waved his hat with silent vigor the sun had gone behind the clouds as the ship slid out on its way a stray beam pierced the grayness it shone on a red head and of the gem collector by p g woodhouse